Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Built in the 1800s, the Oregon State Hospital has a reportedly insidious past that went on for years. Once an insane asylum, it is said that terrible malpractice occurred within its walls and that it had a secret tunnel that connected the buildings which shrouded these terrible experiments that were rumored to have been conducted on its patients. Today, part of the hospital has been preserved as a museum, and even now, visitors to the hospital claim to have experienced paranormal activity, where they feel as if they are being watched while on the premises. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here, you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… It was 1973, in the small town of Murfreesboro, Illinois, had quite a scare with numerous people encountering what many described as a large, gorilla-like creature. We might call it Bigfoot or Sasquatch. They called it a big, muddy monster. In November 1978, four employees at a hamburger restaurant are kidnapped and murdered. Almost 45 years later, seven employees at a fried chicken establishment are found slain their bodies found in the restaurant's walk-in freezer. One case found justice. The other is still waiting. In Germanic and Scandinavian folklore, a child murdered by their mother is known as a kindermorderin, and if that child is a boy and decides to appear from beyond the dead, he's considered a radiant boy, and there are numerous stories of their hauntings. Grace Stevens was excited to attend her company's annual picnic with friends and co-workers, dressing for the occasion, hoping to possibly meet her future Prince Charming. Her company was splurging and inviting everyone to take a ship from Chicago across Lake Michigan to attend the party in Michigan City. They never arrived. In 1947, a woman jumped to her death from the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. Yet today, her ghost still needs to use the building's bathroom facilities. But first, the governor called it mass murder in 1942 when 47 patients died at the Oregon State Hospital, all within hours. All of them poisoned. Finding the murderer and motive would lead to an unexpected conclusion and to an unrelenting haunting. 
we begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Appointment with Fear This is your storyteller, the man in black, here again to bring you another fast-eyed tale. I have told you many stories to chill the spine since first we met, but there is one particular subject I have rather neglected. Insanity. I could unfold many charming tales of the mentally unstable, but I've chosen one tonight that will appeal to the more subtle listener. So, while I tell you of Gerald and Adela Madelon and the provocative Pauline, we trust we shall keep our promise to bring you... An Appointment with Fear. Come now to a gloomy, pretentious building somewhere in Gloucestershire. Victorian Gothic at its worst. Once the home of a wealthy manufacturer. Now an institution. An asylum for the insane. The medical officer is showing a visitor around. No. I'm afraid these mental institutes are not very exhilarating. No, Doctor. I think they're ghastly. Oh, no, no. Come, come, my dear lady. I do. I don't mind the real loonies, like that little man over there, or even the dangerous ones. It's the simple, quiet, sweet-looking people that seem so awfully sad. Yes, I know. But that white-haired lady over there, for instance. That one? Yes. Well, over 30 years she's been here. 30 years? Well, you've hit a very pathetic case. Really? She lost her husband in the Lusitanic. Oh. You, you remember that dreadful affair? Mm. One of those odd cases where a shock can be too much for the mental balance. How appalling. Is she... She's a Mrs. Madeline. At first they thought she might recover, I believe. It's hopeless, then. Oh, quite. But she looks so sane. Mm. She thinks she's still on the Lusitanic. Oh, no. Oh, yes. We're all fellow passengers. <laughs> Don't mean it. Oh, yes. She thinks her husband's still alive? She's never mentioned his name. Really? You see that gramophone? Yes. She's always got it with her. It plays some tune she must have heard on the boat. Oh, no. They tell me that when she first came here, she was always asking for the ship's band to play it. So they got a record. When she weeps a lot, we put it on. And then she laughs. Makes her happy. Well, uh, no. It's a queer sort of laugh. But why, I wonder? You must never ask why when you're dealing with the insane. That is why they're insane. Would you like to speak to her? Yes. Well, come along then. She's quite charming. Who does she think you are? I vary. Sometimes I'm a passenger and sometimes a ship's officer. Ah, uh, Mrs. Madeline. Well, how are we today? I'm a, a little cold. It, it gets colder, you know, near the banks of Newfoundland. Uh, does it, indeed? <laughs> Is this your first voyage? It is, isn't it? Yes. Are you staying in New York? Yes. Oh, so am I. I'm going to try the new plaza. They say it's wonderful. Then I, I'm going on to Baltimore. I like to think of where one's going to. Don't you? Never mind the past or the present. Get them out of your mind, don't you think? Uh, yes, perhaps. One shouldn't I... think, you know. You can make yourself not think. 
Ah, the ship's band is going to get to work. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Oh, there we are. They play that tune for me. Isn't it good of them? Don't you think it's rather attractive? Yes, I do. Rather consoling, don't you think? And yet rather cynical, so to speak. Or shall we say sardonic? <laughs> I'm afraid I must intrude upon this poor lady's strange delusions. You heard that mental expert tell his visitor that no one dreams of asking why in his domain. Shall we ask why on this occasion? So be it then, we will. So come with me along the years. The Mid-Atlantic, a mighty vessel, 2,000 souls aboard. A still, calm night. And then, disaster. Laughter and life and wealth and glittering glory and then, nothing. Nothing. I would recall those words of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, if we might pause a moment. The ship was gone. The crew was gone. And the deep shuddered and the moon shone. What are you doing out here? Getting a breath of air? But, my dear girl, it's freezing. I don't mind. Oh, don't you? Well, I do. I, I'm going to get a drink. Gerald. Yes? We'll sit under the bridge. It's quite sheltered. What do you mean? Well, there's, uh, there's steam heat on here. Ah. Well, what's all this about? Gerald, Pauline is on this ship. What? Well... Who told you? Does that matter? Well, what if she is? I see. Oh, well, now the fun starts. We're due in on Monday. I'll get a boat back on the Wednesday. Adler, heavens above, you can't do that. This time I've had enough. We've had all this before. Don't shout, please. I see you booked her in the second class so that we should meet, I suppose. Oh, Ty. Just one moment. I finished with you after your last bout. I've come with you this trip for the sake of your mother and father. That was all. And now at this moment, I wouldn't speak to you. If it... If it wasn't for this wretched little fool you've dragged out. I... I love her. Cut that out. And she loves me. I'll admit it. I fooled you all right. My dear man, I expect to be fooled. You fooled me from the very day we met. If you're going to drag out the past I'm not. And bri- Listen. That last bout of yours, what the doctors called nervous breakdown... All right, D.T., go on. Well, it shook you. You said you pulled yourself together. I was sorry for you. You did pull yourself together. And I did truly believe we were going to make a fresh start. So this trip was arranged. And now you've carted out this woman to keep on tap because you can't help cheating. Because you're vile. Utterly and completely vile. I see. We're not, we're not going to make a song and dance about it or anything of that sort. I'll go to some hotel by myself and book the passage home. That's all, General. Goodbye. Right, her, then. I very glad to hear you've got enough cash. Oh, no, madam, uh, the purser's just gone into his office. Oh, thank you. Here, you, I, I want a double whiskey and soda. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, where is the purser's office? Uh, will you follow me, madam? I'll have that drink in the smoking room. Uh, very well, sir. Not painting the concert, madam? Uh, no, I... I may go in later. It's pretty cold, madam. Yes. 
Yet the sea's so calm, it looks like oil. Mm, that means there's ice about. They're off the banks. Uh, in here? There's the door on the left, madam. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Oh, Mrs. Madeline. Uh, the chief steward says it's quite all right. Oh. This young man will conduct you. I'm very much obliged. Uh, this way, madam. Thank you. Hello, Madeline. How about a little poker? No, I don't want any blasted cards. Well, look here. All the girls want to dance tonight. It's as smooth as a skating rink. All right, huh? Well, let's be festive. Come on, Madeline. Where's your missus? I'll go to blazes. Oh, what's the matter with you? Oh, I say, oh, Lord Alcaster's getting up an auction for the sailor's home. You know, autographs and things. Oh, blast the sailor's home. Oh, what's oh. the matter with him? Don't say he's started again. I blush to mention it. The next valuable souvenir I am about to auction is a garter. <laughs> worn by a famous actress of the motion picture. <laughs> <laughs> Change over, watch. Hi, hi. Evening, sir. Evening. We're running into ice. Yes, sir. I, I think we are. It's pretty clear, sir. I know, but uh, double the lookout. Double the lookout. Hi, hi, sir. Double the lookout. Talking of oil, if Pierpont Morgans are going to take that issue up, I'll be prepared to name a price on your holdings. Without the current dividend? Uh oh, no, with it. <laughs> Not on your life. If you share the bonus? Oh, well, now you're talking. <laughs> you're a smart fellow, Walter. <sighs> yeah, let's get inside. It's too darn cold. Sure. A couple of hundred thousand is not worth double pneumonia. Right ho, bright boy. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> Good evening, Pauline. You? Yes. They, uh, they gave me a permit to visit your lowly quarters. Very nice, too. Less garish and more comfortable than our magnificence. Adela, how did you find out? Don't get excited, Pauline. Don't look at me like that. What are you going to do? Going back home at once. By the first ship I can get hold of. No. No. Yes, Pauline. And if you'll take my advice, you'll do the same. So that's your game. Go easy, Pauline. Very well, then. I love Jerry. I can't help it. I've done my best, and he loves me. We just can't help it. Yes, I know. I must say it, I must. He does think the world of you. He says so, and all you've done for him. But this is something that has come into his life. <laughs> if only he'd think of something new. I knew you'd think that. Very well, then. Go back home. Go back. I'm glad. I want you to. And I'll be glad. So we'll both be glad. So let's be perfectly calm about it. I am calm. Pauline, will you just listen for a moment? Well? There, there are certain men who, whose culminating ecstasy is only achieved in breaking a woman's heart. If you ask them, they couldn't tell you why. And what that appeal is to women, God only knows. But it's there. Jerry, my husband, is a useless waster. He has no charm, no wit, no guts. He's, he's lost whatever looks he had, and he hasn't a friend in the world. Well, I loved him, all right, believe me. 
And now, I don't even hate him. I only know him as a, an evil thing that would be better dead. Go on, Adela. I, I know you, Pauline. And your sister, and your two nice brothers, and, and that decent boy who loves you very dearly. When I implore you to come back with me, I'm thinking of you, your life, everything. For God's sake, believe me. I don't believe you. You want him still. Oh, don't. Will you please go away? I don't want to see you. I never want to see you again. All right, Pauline. I shall tell Jerry. Do whatever you like. Goodbye. Splendidly so far. <laughs> My next souvenir is a bit of a surprise. Oh. A brace of pheasants. Oh. <laughs> the gift of Lord Henry Jiffer. Oh. He was taking them to Senator Osdor at Washington. Shame. But now he's changed his mind. Oh. <laughs> I love this foxtrot. I love anything with you. So perfectly steady. My bit of Carlton. I don't care where it is with you. Now, now, be good. Uh, are you taking over? Yes, sir. I'll stay up a bit, I think. Not too good, is it? No, we ought to stack him down a bit. You're still staying out here, madam? It's terribly cold. Oh, I'm well wrapped up, Sturgis. So I see, madam. The, uh, the band conductor wants to know if there's anything you'd like him to play. Oh, how nice of him. Uh, do, you, uh, do you think he'd play Yama Man once more? Yama Man, uh, I'll ask him. early tonight, sir. What's it got to do with you? Um, anything you'd like, sir? Yes. Where's the whiskey? Here you are, sir. And the siphon, sir. Good. Put one of those white tablets in a glass of water. These, sir? That's it. They've got to dissolve. I see, sir. Put in two. Two, sir? That's what I said. Has uh, madam gone to her stateroom, sir? <sighs> I don't care whether the madam's got to a state room or up the smokestack. I see, sir. Good night, sir. And I don't want to be disturbed, see? And what's more, I'm not going to be disturbed. Very well, sir. Is that the tune you wanted, madam? Yes, that's it. They played delightfully. What's all that? Something up. It's the lookout. <laughs> now, any further bid for this lovely coloured photograph of Gary Elise? Oh. $60. $70. $75. $80. 80 Eighty-five. 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 E
Bumps into a ruddy eye. What the there. hell was it? Keep quiet, please. We're making the examination. Are you all right, madam? Yes. What's it all about? Ice, I think. They're stopping her. But the, the whole ship shook. My word, it did. I wonder why they've stopped. Well, they would. They'd have to. Mm. I don't think it's anything much, you know. She'd have shown her list by now. Oh, yes. Well, let's pick up the counters and start again. Do you know, I had a flush. Go on. Yes, I had. What about a jackpot? And what about another drink? No drink, sir. Well, why not? What darn nonsense. Well, uh, are we going to stick here all night, I wonder? <laughs> Perhaps something's gone wrong with the works. Hello, Mrs. Medlin. Hello. A little excitement, wasn't it? Certainly was. Ah, oh, good. The band's begun again. Ah, that's a good sign. Do you hear what they're playing, Sturgis? Yes, madam. What are you looking at? A dick. What about it? Look. Yes. Or is it fancy? No, it's not fancy. No. It isn't, is it? A rocket! That's done it. A rocket! For the love of God! What the blazes? Everyone's wanted on the deck. Oh, let them blast it. Well, go there. I've told you. And get out of it, you hear? Get out, you. Oh. All the cabins cleared? Yes, sir. Quick as you can, lady. Put your eyebrow. Yes, thank you. No one else there? No. No one. Get down to G-deck. Oh, brilliant. Yes, well, yes, yes, yes. Oh, miss, there you are. Yes. Uh, come along with me. There, shipping the wind. Well, what about you? Oh, we'll, we'll go later. Don't you worry about us. Here you are, sir. Another woman. That old lady first, please. Room for the pair of you. Now stand back, please. All in good time. Hard at it, boys. One and two. One and two. Steady there. Listen. The band's still playing. You hear what they are playing? Look. She's going down. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the ship was gone. The crew was gone, and the deep shuddered, and the moon shone. We will not linger on the dreadful scene. It is the next morning. Yet one more boatload of the few survivors are being gently conveyed to the deck of the rescue vessel. Oh, come here. Yes, please, madam, I'm a doctor. Oh. That's a bad cut. Oh, no, it's nothing. But please attend to these others. Oh, Adela. Pauline. Where is he? I don't know. What? Why should I? But I got to his cabin. I dragged him on deck. It was the last boat. They were shoving us in. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. He went back to look for you. He went 
that to look for me. Yes. Yes. He went back to look for me. I think I'd better be going. Yes, I think you ought to hop along. Goodbye, Mrs. Madeline. I envy you your first sight of the skyline of New York. It's quite wonderful. It really is. Yes, I'm sure it is. I'll see you to the gate. Thank you. Oh, poor lady. Seems so sad. Very. But at any rate, we know her history. Sometimes we do not. Oh, yes, that was the very distressing well, thank you so much, Doctor. Oh, here's my car. It's been awfully good of you to show me round. Oh, believe me, it's been a pleasure. And that is the end of the story and the deep shuddered. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Located in Salem, Oregon, many of the original parts of the Oregon State Hospital still remain in use, while other parts are closed off due to severe disrepair. A new wing was constructed in 2011, where most of the patient care takes place now. The grounds look fairly inviting from the outside. There is, unfortunately, very little indication of the kind of horrors that took place within. When the facility was originally built, it was intended to serve all patients, but it soon became overcrowded and, due to this, it became a more specialized facility that served the criminally insane and the mentally handicapped. Visitors are free to tour the campus as well as the interior of the hospital where they learn that an estimated two-thirds of the population was found to be both mentally insane and found guilty of a crime. Although these days the original hospital and asylum are no longer taking patients, the Oregon State Hospital is still in business, but now mostly as a museum, perhaps as a monument to the way we used to treat those who had mental turmoil or abnormal conditions. Taking a tour of the hospital provides those interested with a fairly accurate perspective at the people who were once housed there, as well as the insanity that they actually endured at the hands of doctors who did not have their patients' best interests at heart. The hospital was built in 1883, and for only having existed for almost a century and a half, the building has a lot of stories to tell. Like any old-fashioned asylum, patients fell victim to things that would never be acceptable by today's medical practice standards. Over the years that these terrible experiments, abuse, and torture felt at the hands of both staff and fellow patients, it's estimated that hundreds if not thousands of patients died within the asylum. It's not incredibly surprising that it has the reputation of housing so many tortured souls. If you take a tour of the facilities, 
You'll find the museum is certain to educate people on the terrifying experiences that patients lived through in their time within the hospital. Exhibits fill the halls that were once filled with patients, and the location was made popular when it was used as the filming location for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Surprisingly, it functions still as the state's sole psychiatric hospital. Within the exhibits, visitors can see the entire overview of how procedures for treating mentally ill patients has changed over the years, from its opening in the late 1800s to the present day. Even though the rooms were all remodeled, there lingers an intensely creepy presence throughout the museum. One of the more ghastly stories that haunt the walls of this old facility happened in 1942, when 47 people were killed and hundreds more were struck incredibly ill after they were served their daily breakfast. A ghastly scene unfolded that morning at Oregon State Hospital. Patients began dropping like flies after eating a batch of poisoned scrambled eggs, vomiting blood and writhing on the floor in agony. Some died within minutes, others succumbed hours later. 47 people in all. Officially, there were 263 cases. Newspapers, however, reported more than 400 others were sickened. Governor Charles A. Sprague called it mass murder. Sabotage was initially suspected, what today we would call a terrorist attack. This happened in 1942, with the country engaged in World War II. Fears of sabotage were real, especially on the West Coast. The food supply was considered a vulnerable target. The eggs used at the state hospital came from federal surplus commodities distributed by the U.S. government, part of a shipment received six months earlier and divided between state institutions, schools, and other programs in Oregon. Governor Sprague immediately ordered all institutions to stop using the eggs, which came packed frozen in 30-pound tin cans. The federal government issued a similar order. Investigators from the Army, the American Medical Association, and the Food and Drug Administration rushed to the state hospital campus in Salem, Oregon. Dr. Howard Bowman recently set the scene in November 2017 in one of the exhibit rooms at the Museum of Mental Health, which is dedicated to telling the stories of those who have lived and worked at the hospital. November 18, 1942 was a tragic day for patients and staff. The death toll was staggering, but it could have been worse. The hospital housed an estimated 2,700 patients at that time, more than five times the number today. Survivors and witnesses are long gone. First-hand accounts are limited to what can be found in newspaper archives and a report submitted to the Journal of the American Medical Association by three doctors, two from the hospital and one from an Oregon State Police Crime Lab in Portland. Dr. William L. Leidbeck, a pathologist, was one of those doctors. On call and living in a cottage on a hospital campus, he was one of the first to respond to the horrific scene. Bauman, a retired gastroenterologist, portrays Lidbeck in reenactments at the museum. While sharing Lidbeck's perspective, he stands in front of historic photographs of the hospital's dining room and kitchen. Next to him is a large stainless steel vat with giant ladles hanging from above, much like what would have been used to mix and serve the scrambled eggs that day. When Lidbeck arrived, patients were suffering extreme nausea and abdominal cramping. Many were vomiting blood, having seizures, and struggling to breathe. Others were experiencing paralysis. Bauman can speak with authority about symptoms that would be experienced after ingesting such a virulent poison. His specialty during his 35-year career at Salem Clinic was gastroenterology, the branch of medicine focused on the digestive system. Even today, if this happened, probably the best we could do is support them, Bauman says, the trouble is, it happens so rapidly. He presumes those who ate the most eggs would have died the quickest. For others, death would have been prolonged. The tiny morgue at the hospital could handle only the first few victims. Before the night was over, shrouded bodies were crammed into the chapel and lined up in hallways. 
More might have died if not for the discerning taste buds of some patients and the heroic actions of one staff member. Many patients put their spoons down after complaining the eggs tasted salty or soapy and experiencing immediate symptoms. One survivor, only able to whisper through lips swollen and blue, described it this way in the Daily Capital Journal. My face became numb. My teeth began to ache. Pretty soon, my legs became paralyzed. Nurse Allie Wassell took one bite of the eggs after dinner trays were brought to her ward and the taste was so off she refused to let her patients eat them. Wassell became ill but survived and was credited with saving many lives by her actions. The investigation was swift, considering the rudimentary technology that would have been available. This happened long before email and cell phones and equipment would have been archaic compared to what we have now. Autopsies were done on six patients. Samples from the cooked eggs and stomach contents were sent to the lab in Portland. Bits of eggs, both from the plates of patients and from the hospital's unused supply, were fed to rats. Those fed the cooked eggs died within a few minutes. Surplus eggs were tested up and down the coast. Within 22 hours, according to the report submitted by Lidbeck and his colleagues, the poison was identified as sodium fluoride and it was found only in cooked eggs at Oregon State Hospital. Sodium fluoride is commonly used in insecticides and in rat and cockroach poisons. It is a quick-acting white substance that might easily be mistaken for flour, baking powder, or powdered milk. Ingesting a minuscule amount can be fatal. But how did it get in the eggs? And was it intentional or accidental? The story unraveled when the hospital's assistant cook stepped forward with a confession. He had sent a patient to a basement storeroom for powdered milk, and the patient mistakenly brought back roach poison that was mixed in the scrambled eggs. Similar tragedies happened elsewhere before modern food safety regulations were adopted. In 1940, at a Salvation Army shelter in Pennsylvania, 12 men died and 48 others were sickened when roach powder was mixed into pancake batter. The Vocational Rehabilitation Services Program at Oregon State Hospital is robust, exposing patients to a variety of work experience opportunities that enable them to improve self-esteem, feel productive, and earn a wage. Jobs can be had in janitorial, landscaping, and library services, and yes, food services as well. They're not working where the food is actually being prepared, says Tom Anhalt, Director for Vocational and Educational Services. Where they're really working is in the back, washing dishes, cleaning up, and preparing for the lines. The grave mistake like the one with the scrambled eggs couldn't happen today for many reasons, the most important of which is constant supervision. Patients are assessed before leaving their living unit and heading to work. Supervisors are required to always have a line of sight on patients, escorting them to and from the kitchen area. There's no way they can go somewhere without supervision, not even to the bathroom, says Kent Hunter, Director of Food and Nutrition Services for the Salem campus. Patients who work in food services today must have a food handler's card and go through additional safety and sanitation training. We follow higher standards than what Marion County requires of us, Hunter says. Both he and Anhalt agree it would be next to impossible for someone today to mistakenly grab rat poison or any other dangerous substance and add it to a meal. None of those chemicals are even allowed anywhere near kitchen and food services, Hunter says. George Nosen admitted himself to Oregon State Hospital in the summer of 1942. He was 27, paranoid schizophrenic, and assigned to kitchen work detail. He was the one sent to the basement and unknowingly scooped up roach powder instead of powdered milk. Assistant cook Abraham McKillop needed the ingredient to mix with the eggs that day and apparently didn't have time to fetch it himself. The investigation found the institution to be understaffed and noted that the hospital dietitian responsible for the storing of foodstuffs had recently left to work at Camp Adair. The war took a toll on the staff. According to a timeline exhibit at the Museum of Mental Health, 
Oregon ranked second to last in the nation among staff-to-patient ratios at state institutions in 1939. Due to the number of employees drafted, it averaged one staff member per 10.4 patients. On that regretful day, McKillop handed Nosen the key to a storeroom, a violation of Rule 8, which was established at the hospital in 1908, forbidding the entrusting of keys to patients. Nosen reportedly had accompanied kitchen staff to the basement storerooms before, but there were two described in grand jury testimony as 11 feet apart and opened by the same key. Nosen entered the wrong one and retrieved the wrong white powder. As patients were dying before their eyes, McKillop and the chief cook, Mary O'Hare, retraced Nosen's steps and discovered what had happened. They kept silent before cracking under the pressure of repeated questioning by investigators. We were both scared so bad we didn't know what to do, McKillop later testified. On November 23rd, five days after the deadly dinner was served, the two cooks were arrested. McKillop was charged with involuntary manslaughter. O'Hare was charged with accessory after the fact. After a lengthy probe, charges against the two cooks were dismissed, but there was plenty of blame to go around. To hear Ballman reenact the story, the media pointed fingers at the hospital for failure to follow safety measures and hospital officials pointed fingers at the legislature for failure to support an institution that was understaffed and overcrowded. Some good things did come out of it, Bauman says. The tragedy had ramifications beyond the hospital. It brought about reforms in food safety. A poison label law was introduced during the next legislative session and eventually was adopted. It also contributed to major changes being made at mental hospitals across the country, including increased staffing and funding. McKillop died in 1946 after a long illness. His obituary in the Oregon Statesman notes he was employed for 11 years at the state hospital. No obituary could be found for O'Hare. Nosen died in 1983 at the hospital after an altercation at the institution. The official cause of death was heart disease. He had a reputation of being combative and getting into fistfights with fellow patients who never stopped blaming him for the poisoning. It haunted him for the rest of his life. But the most heartbreaking chapter of this tragic tale is about the 40 men and 7 women ranging from age 18 to 80 who died from eating the contaminated eggs. The cremated remains of 13 of them have yet to be claimed at the hospital. It should probably be no surprise that there is talk of some spookiness lingering at the hospital. Visitors to the hospital and museum claim to have experienced paranormal activity where they feel as if they are being watched while on the premises. What remains within the walls of the Oregon State Hospital, including the intimidating and creepy underground tunnels, has created an environment where those who have investigated have felt an overwhelming sense of evil. The brave souls who willingly explore the tunnels and other areas of this haunted asylum are undeterred by the stories about patients allegedly being transported in the tunnels below the facility, or the evidence that suggests they were used for immoral, unethical, and barbaric medical experiments. This all took place so deep underground that their screams could not be heard phantom footsteps, doors opening and closing on their own. Screams and cries from former patients can all be experienced at the Oregon State Hospital. A lot of the unrest that can be found here can also probably be attributed to the controversy at the hospital staff having lost over 1,500 cans of patients' cremated remains. Coming up, Grace Stevens was excited to attend her company's annual picnic with friends and co-workers, dressing for the occasion, hoping to possibly meet her future Prince Charming. Her company was splurging and inviting everyone to take a ship from Chicago across Lake Michigan to attend the party in Michigan City. They never arrived. But first, in Germanic and Scandinavian folklore, a child murdered by their mother is known as a Kinder Mordoran, 
and if that child is a boy and decides to appear from beyond the dead, he's considered a radiant boy, and there are numerous stories of their hauntings. These stories when Weird Darkness Returns. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Well, this is great. Rain, rain rain. I'll bet even the ducks wouldn't come out in weather like this. But me, I'm an idiot. I gotta go and take up a profession like being a writer. I couldn't take up something easy. Oh, no, not me. I gotta be a writer so I can be out on nice, cold, wet nights, beating my brains out, looking for an idea. <laughs> Idea. Deadline. Oh, sure. Mustn't forget that ever-loving deadline. <laughs> what a way to make a living. I could have stayed a reporter at the Star Times and had nice assignments. Like listening to political speeches. Or covering the opening of a new manhole. Oh, no. But not me. I have to write fiction. Do it the hard way. Well, I might as well take the usual hand, open the usual door to the usual place, and hear the usual comments. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hiya. Copy, copy, boy. Hiya, Dan. What do you say, Ed? A fifth editor wants you. How goes it, Holiday? Oh, pretty good. Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. How are you? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hello, Susie. Anything in box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What a character I am. Standing here in front of the wanted counter in a newspaper office while the rain runs down off my coat collar into my shoes. Mr. Holliday. I got to ruin my last pair of... Huh? What's that, Susie? I said there's a message in box 13 for you. Here. Oh. Thanks, Susie. Don't mention it. Say, hey, aren't you going to open it? Sorry. Not here, Susie. You know, you got all of us down here at the Star Times awful curious, Mr. Holliday, running that ad. Have I? You've been running it for months. Why don't you change it? Well, I haven't read it for so long, I've forgotten the words. How's it go? Don't you remember? 
adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. How about that? I still like it. You'd do a lot better with adventure if you ran your picture with the ad. Oh, no, thanks. Just keep on running it the way it is. But, gee, aren't you ever going to tell us what you do for a living? Why you keep running that ad? Susie, same old question, same old answer. No. Well, if I'm not doing anything else, at least I've got the people at the Star Times curious. They'd think my brain cells were ten feet off first base if they knew why I really run that ad. Well, maybe they are. Hmm. You can help a person out of great trouble and gain an adventure for yourself if you call Chester 8945 and ask for Carla Williams. Chester 8945. Carla Williams. Hmm. Sounds like an interesting name. Well, I hope she's home. Hello? Oh, uh, this is the man from Box 13. Oh? Tell me, are you serious or was that ad just a joke? No joke, Miss Williams. Are you willing to try anything? Well, uh, that depends what's on your mind. I can't discuss it over the phone. Will you meet me? Of course. There's a little French restaurant down on Ledge Street. Meet me there in the cocktail lounge. Uh, what time? Make it ten o'clock tonight. Tell the bartender you want to speak to Carla Williams. French restaurant on ledge, ten o'clock. Oh, uh, what block number? The 600 block. You won't fail me, you'll be there. Lady, if it were a winter, I'd come with bells on. This sounds like the beginning of a very interesting story. Beautiful woman in distress calls on struggling writer for help. Only she doesn't know I'm a writer, and I don't know she's beautiful. What's yours, mister? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm looking for a Carla Williams. Oh, yeah. She's sitting over there in that front booth. Thanks. Uh, Carla Williams? Yes. Oh, ho. Carla Williams could be material for a love story or an adventure story. Or, uh, maybe both. And, uh, do you have a name? Oh, uh, yes. Dan Holliday. Uh, I sit down. Oh, thanks. I'm, uh, agreeably surprised. I didn't think a person would get such a satisfactory reply from a ward ad. And I didn't think I'd get such a nice replier. You're wondering about me, aren't you? You're wondering why you're here. Naturally. Well, I'm being blackmailed. That's a very nasty business. I've been paying blackmail for five years, but tonight's the end. I'm to meet him in 15 minutes and make the final payment and get the letters. Well, that sounds like the end of your troubles. But is it? I can't be sure. That's why I need your help. But what can I do? Well, you can be there as, as a witness. You can make sure this is the end. You can see that I get the letters and get away safely. Oh, uh, lady, you need the police. Why? To make sure everything I've kept hidden for five years comes out in the open? Maybe a friend could do it. My friends would be the last ones on earth I'd want to know. Are you afraid? No. You advertised for adventure? Blackmail isn't my idea of adventure. I'm sorry if my trouble doesn't measure up to your expectations. It's the best I could do on such short notice. Uh-oh. Well, I guess I had that coming. Maybe this isn't your idea of adventure, but I do need help. I need help badly. Let, let's leave it at that. Now, that might appeal to my early Boy Scout training. Then you will? I always help ladies across blackmail wraps. Uh, what happens if your friend makes trouble? We can't make any trouble. He seems to have done all right for the past five years. There won't be any trouble if you're along. Here, reach under the table. Take this. Oh, uh, now wait a minute. 
This is a gun. Put it in your pocket. Don't let anyone see it. This is supposed to make everything all right? Well, you won't need it. Believe me, I, I thought it would make you feel better. It makes me feel like a policeman. And I still think a policeman is what you want. But you promised. I said maybe. I have to meet him in 15 minutes. Please help me. Where do we go? His apartment. Far from here. We can make it if we leave now. What do you say? Maybe I should never have been a Boy Scout. I watch Carla Williams closely as we ride over to the apartment where she's to meet this man she's been talking about. She's perfectly groomed with a certain niceness about her, except for those twin furrows of worry between her eyes and a cold look of anxiety. I don't think I would like to have her angry at me, though. That's funny. You should have been here 20 minutes ago. Huh. Uh, why don't you try the door? It was unlocked. Might as well wait inside. Unless you have any objections. Not at all. There's a light switch on your right. The living room is straight ahead. Say, you sound like you're familiar with the place. Why not? I've been here many times before. There's a light on in there. Suppose he might have fallen asleep? Waiting for his money? Hardly. Well, this is more like it. This spot is nicely furnished. With my money. But at least we can sit down and make us... Make us... Oh, no. Miss Williams, what's the matter? What happened? By the floor. By the desk, look. You stay here. Better call the police. He's dead. Dead? Yeah, he's been shot. Once. Through the heart. I'm glad. I'm glad. He's the one? The man who was blackmailing you? Yes. Would you... Could you go through his pockets? He must have some of those letters with him. Look in his coat pocket. Uh, Just a minute, Miss Williams. You don't understand. This man has been murdered. We've got to call the police. Murdered? What makes you so sure? There's no gun around any place. Just the same before the police come. His pockets... Please, I've got to have those letters. Okay, but it isn't right. Are these what you wanted? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, they're all here. Now, where's the telephone? We've got to get the police up here and fast. There is no phone. No, how do you know without looking unless... I told you I've been here before. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, go downstairs. There's a pay phone in the lobby. Tell the police to come up here right away. And come back and we'll wait for them. You're not planning to leave while I'm downstairs, are you? No. Here, here's a nickel. Just dial O and tell the operator you want the police. Hurry. But you, you'll be here. Call, I said. I wanted adventure, so I put an ad in a newspaper. And I certainly found what I wanted. Only this isn't good. A man is lying dead on the floor of this apartment. And Carla Williams and I will have to get down to the police headquarters and answer a million questions. All of them embarrassing. Uh, I hope she's made the calls. Say, that's funny. Why would there be a telephone directory in a place where there's no phone? Or maybe there is one. Of course, right here in the hallway. I wonder why she said there was no phone here. Maybe it's been disconnected. Hmm. Operator. This is the operator. Oh, fine. I've written a dozen stories like this. And whenever I've reached this point, the hero always finds that he's been framed. <laughs> framed? The gun. Yeah, I gotta look at that gun. To find out if it's been fired. One shot has been fired. And the police surgeon will probably find a bullet from this gun in that dead man's body. The police. Seems like little Carla took care of that. Hmm. Me, I'm going to take care of something else. 
I'm leaving. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Once again, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, right now I'm wishing I were half as smart as the heroes of some of my stories. I've got a murder, a strange woman, a strange apartment, and a strange feeling that this might not work out to a happy ending. What I need is a cab, a quick trip home, a short drink, and a long, long think. Sure is a rotten night to be out. Yeah, it sure is. Never seen such rain. Not so good. Cops are sure busy tonight. Sounds like it. Wonder who they're after. I uh, wouldn't have any idea. Could be a murderer, you know. Yeah, just could be. Just a night for a murder. Perfect. How come you got so wet? It's uh, raining. <laughs> I know, but how come? My umbrella needs recovering. You want the Normandy arms? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's your building up ahead, but it looks like you've got lots of company. What do you mean? Them's prowl cars, mister, all over the place. Oh, this is very nice. Carla Williams called the police and must have mentioned my name in passing. I'm the type of interesting young fellow that any cop would like to meet. Especially with a murder weapon in my pocket. Tonight, Mr. Holliday, I think you will sleep elsewhere. Want me to pull right in where all them cops are? No, they look busy, so maybe we'd better not bother them. Just keep on driving. But this is where you live, ain't it? I don't feel like going home tonight. I could shove them cops aside, you know. This is legitimate hack. Uh, that would be fun, but don't bother. You're the boss, mister. Where to? Uh, there's a place down on Franklin Avenue. 1612, I think. I know that place. That's the cheapest hotel in town. Yes, I believe it is. Hey, how do you know about a place like that? I got information there for a story. But a joint like that? What are you going there tonight for? To sleep. You writing another story? I'm living one. Living one? Yes, I left my typewriter at home. Well, Mr. Holliday, to what do we owe this great pleasure? Maybe you're just lucky. More research on the seamier side of life? No, not tonight. I'm... Looking for a room. A room? Might I remind you, Mr. Holliday, this ain't the Roney Plaza. Have you got a room? Any particular exposure you might like? The less, the better. I'm sure we can fix you up. That is, if you're willing to pay in advance. Buck, buck and a half, how much? Twenty-five dollars, Mr. Holliday. Twenty-five dollars? And if you committed the murder, it'll be fifty dollars, Mr. Holliday. Come on, talk straight. I don't want any trouble with the police. What makes you think I'll cause you trouble with the police? Little box called the radio. Police calls. They're a lot of fun to listen to, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, I'll bet they are. You'll be comfortable here and safe. I'm beginning to wonder if I could afford it. With your money? <laughs> don't make me laugh. I wasn't trying to. Where's your phone? The one on the wall costs a nickel. Thanks. You're staying tonight, Mr. Holliday? got back there in a hurry. You? Where are you? Still in town. What about the police? They with you? What do you think? Thanks for putting in a good word for me. I had to. They made me. Look, I, 
I want to talk to you. I know that feeling. I want to talk to you, too. I can explain everything. Like a gun with one bullet fired? Yes. A missing telephone that wasn't? That, too. Oh. Then you're just a little girl I want to have words with. Can you come over here right away? Are the police there? Oh, that's right. Name a place I'll meet you. The corner of 6th and Victor. Ten minutes. Right. Follow me, Mr. Holiday. I'll work, too. Your room. This ain't the Roney Plaza, but the service is just the same. I've changed my mind. You're not staying? Your rates are too high. I'll drop in again after I've made a fortune. Now I know how the fox feels when the hounds are closing in. Hmm. Someday I'll have to write a story about a fox. Put that guy Burgess and his Peter Rabbit out of business. Hey, Cap! Oh, it's you again. Yeah, I get around, don't I? I thought you were set for the night. No running ice water. Sixth and Victor. Where did you say you wanted to go? Sixth and Victor. But there ain't no place to sleep there. Oh, I'm not sleepy. I just want to examine a fire hydrant. Okay, mister. I'm glad it's your money and not mine. If we keep on, it will be your money. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Say, uh, is that tonight's extra lying up there? Sure. Want to take a look at it? Oh, yeah, thanks. That picture they got of you on the front page is lousy. What picture? You look like you was facing the camera through a screen door. Yeah, let me see that. Well, 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 this is just wonderful. Prominent writer named by police. Carla Williams accuses Dan Holliday of the murder of Harry Granger. Grief-stricken girl witnessed the murder of her fiancé. Well, nice going, Carla. It's your word against mine, plus the evidence against me. Now I know why they wrote that song, I Get Along Without You Very Well. Well, there's Six and Victor. Cruise on by. You ain't gonna stop? I haven't made up my mind. Looks like a couple of cops waiting around for somebody. It's the way it looks to me. That might be the law. Yes, they might be. What do you want to do now? Get away from here and find a city directory. A chap by the name of Harry Granger should have a home. And he should have stayed in it. I'm either just ahead of the police or right behind them. And if this game keeps up much longer, I'll be right with them. Yeah? Oh, uh, Harry Granger live here? He did. You the police? Well, no, not exactly. A reporter? I used to be. Come here, you. I wonder if you're one of them blackmailers. Just a minute, friend. My coat rips easy. No, I guess not. If you were, you wouldn't be here. Mind if I step in? Come in, come in. This whole thing's got me all upset. You don't say. Oh, uh, you said something about a blackmailer. That's what I'm here for. I came to help Harry get rid of those rats. You mean he was being blackmailed? For five years. I lent him most of the money to pay off with. I told him he was a sucker, but it looks like I got here too late. You heard what happened? Saw it in the papers on my way from the station. Have you told the police? Not yet, but I'm going to. Who did you say you were? I didn't say. You know something about this? I think I do now. I began to see the light when the city directory listed this place as... Ranger's apartment. Can I help? You might get into trouble. Well, how? Breaking into a woman's apartment. After this, I'll use a fire escape and more of my stories of the most interesting things about a building. The from homicide will be out in the hall seeing that no one comes in here. I'll have to work fast, Holloway. You'll have to find something that the police weren't looking for. Must be something. Bills, letters, cards, that's no good. Look, look for the obvious. That's, that's what I always have my hero doing. That's what's the obvious. Oh, the living room. Now, let's see. That's where the body was. Nothing obvious there. On the desk. No, no. The table. No. The fireplace. Hello, hello, hello. 
A small frame snapshot. And I think it might be just what I'm looking for. My old friend, the bartender, and Carla Williams. And with your arms around each other. You know, you two make a nice couple, a wonderful couple. I wonder if they'll let you have your arms around each other in the electric chair. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I finally made it. I'm down at police headquarters in the office of a tall, gangly character named Lieutenant Kling. Of course, a few things have happened. Carl and the bartender were brought in, too. And so much cooler than I am. Oh, those cell bars give you such fine ventilation. Holiday. Um, what's that, Lieutenant? I said you were a very lucky citizen. After what Carla Williams told us, we thought you were guilty. If she'd have told me that story, I'd have believed it myself. But proving that she and the bartender were married put a crimp in her act as the injured fiancé. Yeah, you showed it up as the same old racket. Smart woman teams up with smart man to blackmail innocent citizen. But just the same, I think you should stick to your writing and let police work alone. A lieutenant, I'll have that printed and framed in blonde walnut. And hang it on the wall? <sighs> no, around my neck. I'm glad to hear you say that. You may not always have a guy like this Grant who backed up your story. Oh, uh, Granger's friend? That's the what? Say, he's a nice fella. Wants me to visit him on his ranch. Why don't you do that? Riding the range all day when I could be cooking in town? Uh, pardon me. Homicide, Lieutenant Kling. Oh, yes, yes, he's here. It's for you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Yes, Susie. Can you come down to Star Times right away? Well, what's the matter? There's another letter for you in Box 13. Oh, no, no, no. Should I uh, open it and read it to you? Oh, not now, Susie. I I've got enough material to last me for a month. Three weeks of which will be a rest. Tell me where. Maybe I can come down and help you. You really want to help me? Sure I do, Mr. Holliday. Then put that letter back in box 13. But, Mr. Holliday... Good night, Susie. Next week... Same time, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Ellen Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Ever had that eerie feeling of being watched? There's no one there. At least, nobody you can see anyway. But still, you can feel those ghostly eyes upon you, the watchers in the shadows waiting for their moment to scare you, haunt you, or something even worse. That is the theme for these carefully selected creepy true stories of the paranormal designed to have you wondering if you too are being watched from the shadows. This all-new collection includes stories about the Hat Man, Black-Eyed Kids, Shadow People, Poltergeists, UFOs, the premonitions of a dying man, forest demons, and much more, all absolutely true, all chosen by the master of the paranormal himself, G. Michael Vasey. Watched from the Shadows, Scary True Stories of the Paranormal, available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. boy 
is the glowing ghost of a boy who had been murdered by his mother and whose appearance portends ill luck and violent death. Radiant boys appear in the folklore of England and Europe, possibly originating with the Kinder Mordoran, the children murdered by their mothers, of Germanic folklore. There are numerous radiant boy stories in the Cumberland area of England, which was settled by Germanic and Scandinavian peoples in the 9th and 10th centuries. A radiant boy once haunted the Howard family's Corby Castle in Cumberland, making its most famous appearance in 1803. The castle, really a manor house, stands on a fortification site once used by the Romans. Part of the old house adjoins a Roman-built tower. According to an account written in 1824, the radiant boy haunted a room and part of the old house adjoining the tower. The origin of the ghost is not known, but he plagued many an overnight guest with his appearances and noises. The room had an air of gloom, which Howard sought to dispel by changing some of the furniture. Howard recorded in his journal that an incident took place on September 8, 1803, involving the rector of Greystoke, who, with his wife, was among the guests staying at the castle. The rector and his wife had planned to stay several days, but after their first night they announced at breakfast that they intended to depart. The Howards were stunned. Some time later, the rector confessed the reason. Howard quoted him as saying, "'Soon after we went to bed, we fell asleep. It might be between one and two in the morning when I awoke. I observed that the fire was totally extinguished, but although that was the case and we had no light, I saw a glimmer in the middle of the room which suddenly increased to a brighter flame. I looked out, apprehending that something had caught fire, when, to my amazement, I beheld a beautiful boy clothed in white with bright locks resembling gold standing by my bedside, in which position he remained some minutes, fixing his eyes upon me with a mild and benevolent expression. He then glided gently toward the side of the chimney, where it is obvious there is no possible egress, and entirely disappeared. I found myself again in total darkness, and all remained quiet until the usual hour of rising. I declare this to be a true account of what I saw at Corby Castle, upon my word as a clergyman. It is not known if anything ill befell the rector. Some twenty years later he was still talking about the ghost. The radiant boy no longer haunts the castle. The room, called the Ghost Room, is a study. Lord Castlereagh, second Marquis of Londonderry and one of England's most illustrious statesmen in the early 19th century, allegedly saw a radiant boy years before he committed suicide. There are different versions of the story. According to one, the episode occurred when he was a young man, Captain Robert Stewart. He was posted in Ireland, and one day he went hunting and became lost. With darkness coming on, he sought lodging at the home of a gentleman. There were other guests in the house, and Stewart was invited to stay a few days and join their hunt. He agreed. When it came time to retire, Stewart was taken to a room with little furniture and a blazing fire. He fell asleep and was awakened suddenly by a bright light in the room. At first, he thought it was the fire. The fire, however, had gone out, but the light seemed to emanate from the chimney. Gradually, Stewart became aware of the glowing form of a beautiful naked boy surrounded by a dazzling brilliance. The boy gave him an earnest look and then faded away. Stewart thought that he had been played a joke and was mightily offended. The following morning, he brusquely announced his departure. The host managed to pry the details out of him and gave the butler a tongue lashing for putting Stewart in the boy's room. The butler protested that he had lit a fire to keep him from coming out. The host explained to Stewart that according to a tradition in his family, whoever saw the radiant boy would first rise to great prosperity and power and then suddenly die a violent death. Stuart, the second heir in line in his family, was unconcerned. Within a few years, however, his older brother drowned in a boating accident. Stuart left the army and entered politics, rising quickly. He was influential in creating the Act of Union between England and Ireland in 1800. He served as a Secretary of War in 1805 and 1807 and as Foreign Secretary from 1812 on. Despite his success, 
He was not well-liked and was even hated by many for his cold demeanor. In 1821, his father died, making him Lord Castlereagh, second Marquis of Londonderry. In 1822, Lord Castlereagh's fortunes abruptly began to dim. He suffered from gout, and the stresses of his career began to take a heavy personal toll. He became paranoid and suspicious and acted strangely and was feared to be losing his mind. He was confined to his country house, North Cray Place, and forbidden to have razors lest he do something foolish. On August 12, 1822, he took a penknife and slashed his throat, killing himself. Author Edward bulwer lytton later advanced another story as to how Castlereagh came upon a radiant boy. bulwer lytton said that Castlereagh had stayed at Nebworth, the Lytton family seat, at a time prior to his confinement. One morning he appeared at breakfast looking very pale and said that a strange boy with long yellow hair had appeared in his room, sitting in front of the fire. The boy had drawn his finger across his throat three times and then vanished. That story is considered by many to be one of bulwer lytons inventions. He would often invite guests to sleep in the haunted room and then sneak upstairs and scare them. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Come in. What's that? Yes, it is rather dark in here. You see, we never turn on the lights. We don't need any. At the Radio Mystery Theater, all we illuminate is your imagination. We fill it full of ghostly radiations, mysterious emanations, the eerie glow of terrifying images. And now we have a most unusual image for you. The image of a doll. Yes, I said doll. And a very pretty one, too. Long, silky blonde hair. Innocent, round, blue eyes. A charming dress of taffeta and lace. This is the central character of the story you're about to hear. Of course, you're asking, what makes a doll an image of fear and horror? You've got to find it, Jimmy. You've got to get that doll away from him. Okay, honey, okay. Give us a little time. I don't have any time. If something happens to that doll, I'll die. Our mystery drama, The Doll, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Joanne Linville and Ross Martin. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our story begins in the classroom of a small co-educational university. Not a very unusual setting. But today, these young men and women are hearing an unusual lecture. The guest speaker is Professor Eric Douglas, and the subject of his address is written in chalk on the blackboard. Let's step a little closer and see what it says. Homeopathic magic, ancient and modern. Let's be quiet and listen. For thousands of years, People believed they could injure or destroy their enemy by injuring or destroying an image of him. And so they made likenesses in cloth, in wood, in clay. The ancient Egyptians used wax. The wizards would take a drop of a man's blood, clippings from his hair or parings of his nails, and knead them into a wax figure. You mean like a voodoo doll, Professor? 
Uh, voodoo belongs to the modern era, but the idea is exactly the same. Once the doll was made in this fashion, the victim was at the mercy of the sorcerer. So, you see, the doll is really man's oldest toy and perhaps his deadliest. You mean that stuff really works? Well, that is the strangest part of all. Sometimes it works very well. You've got to be kidding, Professor. Young lady, I wonder if you'd like to help me with a little experiment. Me, Professor? Yes. Will you come up front, please? <laughs> now, uh, just for the, uh, the fun of it, uh, shall, we, uh, shall we make a doll? Huh? All right. Now, let's see. What shall we use? Um... Yeah, now, this little towel will do fine. I'll just try and not to make the head. Oh, there we are. And now let's dress it up a little. Can you help me? How? Well, with some part of you. A, um, a hair from your head, perhaps. <laughs> uh, now, uh, how about uh, something you own? Uh, that ring, maybe. May I borrow that? Well, I... Uh, well, here you are. Thank you. Now, we'll put that around the neck. Voila. We have an instant voodoo doll. Fascinating, isn't it? To know that the doll is meant to be a representation of you? Now, look at it. I'm looking. Yeah, well, keep looking. Now, don't take your eyes off of it. You can almost see your face in the cloth, can't you? It's almost as if the doll is you. Whatever happens to the doll happens to you. You, the doll. You, the doll, sharing one body between you. One life, one destiny. I, I still think it's silly. All right. And let's see what happens when I take this letter knife. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm merely going to plunge this knife into a meaningless piece of cloth. No, don't! <laughs> Prudence? Prudence? You called me professor? Yes. I uh, want to know what you think of this record. Fred Cartwright sent it to me. Claims it's an authentic Dumbala ritual march. I could not say, professor. Hmm. I think it was probably recorded on Hollywood Boulevard. Well, that's enough of that. Well, what's become of Laura? Isn't she home yet? She's just arrived, sir. She's in the living room. Oh. Laura, darling. I didn't hear the door. You're very late. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. I, uh... The match wasn't over until six. It went five sets. And uh, who won? You know you don't care the first thing about tennis. Ah, uh, that's a young man's game. Not for old birds like me. Oh, come on. Stop that. You're far from old. Oh, Prudence, I hope I didn't spoil your dinner. It's all right, Miss Fletcher. I'll go see to it now. Eric, why won't she ever call me Laura? Oh, it's just her way. You know how it is in the islands. A servant's place is a servant's place. Tradition. Mm, it's more than that. It's resentment. You've got your father's sensitivity. Harry was always thinking that people resented him. Maybe he had good reason. He wasn't very popular among his colleagues. Your father was a renegade. That's why. It's one thing to investigate primitive cultures. That's an anthropologist's job. But to spend your life among them, to raise your child among them... No, I never complain. <laughs> well, you managed to turn out pretty happily. But you're uh, still half-savage, of course. Am I? You can't fool me, Laura. You're still a child of voodoo, just like Prudence. Oh, don't be silly, Eric. I know you all right. When the full moon rises and the drums start to beat in the jungle and the serpent god Dumbala raises his hooded head... Eric, stop it. What's the matter? I'm... I'm sorry. I have that... that awful headache. Again? Well, come on, let's take care of it. No, don't bother. I'll be all right in a moment. Best time to stop it is early. Right now. You listen to Dr. Douglas here, and we'll get rid of that pain in two minutes. 
Come on now. Lie back. All right. Now, just relax. Just remember how we've done this before. Yes. I remember. That's right. Now, shut your eyes, Laura. Think of your mind as a large, empty cavern. And in the cavern, you hear my voice. Very faint, as if I'm speaking to you from far, far away. Yes. You feel at peace, relaxed, happy. Your head is clear. Your pain is gone. Yes. It's gone. Oh, you're happy now, Laura. You're happy to be here with me. With me, my darling. Aren't you? Yes. I'm happy. You love me, Laura, don't you? Not in the way you loved your father. You love me as a man. Now say it, darling. Say, I love you, Eric. I love you. Say my name, Laura. My name. I love you, Jimmy. What is the matter with you, Prudence? I'm sorry, Professor. The dish fell from my hand. What is it? What happened? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, my dear. You're fine. You're just fine. Prudence just dropped something. I came to tell you that dinner is ready. Well, so you had a good tennis game, did you? Was it uh, mixed doubles? It was, as a matter of fact. Oh, who was your partner? Not I'm a name Jimmy, by any chance? Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, well, no mystery. You spoke his name while you were hypnotized. Uh, who is Jimmy? Well, his full name is Jimmy Collins. You known him long? About three months. Three months? Well, you never mentioned him before. Oh, I'm sure I did. I'd love for you to meet him, Eric. I'm sure you two would get along. What do you do for a living besides mixed doubles? He's in Wall Street. Well, well. Maybe you started choosing your friends more carefully, darling. I'm glad to see that. But, uh, just the same. Eric, I wish you would stop talking to me like a scolding father. I am not your father. I was talking to you as a friend. I'm sorry. Do you wish dessert now, Professor? Uh, no. No, Prudence, no dessert. Um, gotta stay in trim. <laughs> Who knows? I might take up tennis yet. Laura, I tell you what. Why don't you bring this Jimmy around? I'd love to meet him. No, I'm afraid I don't know much about Haiti, Professor Bernstein. I've never been to the island. Oh, but of course, Laura has told you of her life there. Oh, yes, she's told me all about it. In fact, you spent some time there yourself, didn't you? Yes, a few years. That's where I met Laura and uh, her father, as a matter of fact. You can see that Eric brought back half the island. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have my uh, souvenirs, like uh, this thing, for instance. Hey, what is that? Looks a little tacky to me. Well, they call it an Uwanga packet. It's a charm the voodoo men use for every purpose. Some good and some bad. We should throw out that awful thing, Eric. Oh, it was a gift made for me by an old mamaloy in uh, Port-au-Prince. It's a protective charm, guaranteed to ward off the devil. And, of course, uh, Laura can tell you more about it. Laura's much more of an expert on voodoo than I am. You mean just because she was raised on the island? Well, it's an interesting primitive study, otherwise... Sheer nonsense, of course. Oh. Oh, uh, you shouldn't have said that. You've offended Laura dreadfully. Laura's a believer, you know. She played with voodoo dolls, 
The way other children play with Chatty Cathy and Betsy Whitsy. Eric, please stop it. Ask her, Jimmy. Go ahead, ask her if that isn't so. Oh, I'd feel very foolish asking that question. Oh, Jimmy, of course it isn't so. Well, that's good to hear, frankly. I mean, it'd be a heck of a thing on our honeymoon, waking up and finding in a wanga bag in my slipper. Did you say honeymoon? Yes. Didn't Laura tell you? Laura and I are engaged. We're going to be married next week. <laughs> What do you want? It's late, Professor. After midnight. Leave me alone, Prudence. Go to bed. There is no chain strong enough to hold her. What would you say? The girl is not of your blood. Why do you struggle to keep her? Prudence, I can't lose her. You hear me? If I lose Laura, I die. No, Professor. Oh, you've got to help me. If you want me to live, you've got to help me. There is nothing anyone can and do. There is, there is. There is. There is something that you can do. What is that? I've been thinking about it all night. Prudence, you can make a doll. Well, what have we here? A four-sided triangle? Professor Eric Burnside, young Laura Fletcher, Jimmy Collins, a servant named Prudence. Or is this going to turn out to be a five-sided triangle with the fifth member of the equation, a doll? We'll find out what Prudence can do to help the professor in his emotional dilemma when I return shortly with Act Two. has passed since Laura Fletcher made her earth-shaking announcement to Professor Eric Douglas. The announcement which turned the professor's world completely upside down. But for a man who has looked into the future and found it bleak and empty, Eric seems like a happy man at the moment as he listens to the sound of the Dambala ceremony and waits for Laura Fletcher to enter the room. Eric? I'm here. Laura. Well, let me stop this racket. Well, don't you look lovely. <laughs> and don't you look well. Eric, I can't tell you how good it is to see you smiling. Well, I've got something to smile at, all right? Myself. I uh, don't know what came over me that night, Laura. I, I just was not myself. I couldn't let you run off and get married without my blessing. And a suitable present, of course. A present? Eric, you shouldn't have. You've always admired this ivory charm, and I, uh, I want you to have it. You and Jimmy. Oh, Eric. It's beautiful. It must be priceless. Well, it's not as priceless as our friendship. I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to that. Oh, thank you so much. Jimmy will be as thrilled with it as I am. I think we should talk before you go away, darling. I think we should talk about uh, your father. What about him? I have to ask you this, Laura. Whether or not you've ever told your fiancé the full story. I, uh, I've told him quite a lot. Including the way it ended for him? Don't talk about it now, Eric. Please. No, I still blame myself. I knew that Harry wasn't right in the head. I, uh, I could see the signs. And I shouldn't have let it go as far as I did. Please, Eric. You know that I, I cannot bear to remember that time. I know, I know. You were only 14, but you witnessed it all. His mad delusions. Don't. Oh, my head. Laura, what is it? It's that... The pain again? Yes. Oh, poor darling here. Come on, lean back. It happens every time. I remember my father. Shh. Now, 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 don't talk. Just lean back, relax, close your eyes. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. 
Now breathe deeply, darling. Deeply. Now you remember how we do this together. How we make the pain disappear. How you clear your mind of everything but the sound of my voice. Yes. You can't hear anything but me now, Laura. Just my voice echoing in your mind. You're asleep now. You're so deeply asleep that you won't waken until I tell you. You won't know anything but what you hear me say. Do you understand? Yes. I understand. That's it, my darling. Deep. 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 Prudence? Prudence? Yes, Professor. I'm here. Bring it to me. No, Professor, this is wrong. Bring me the box, Prudence. Very well. Here. Yes. Yes, Prudence, a beautiful doll. That's a beautiful likeness. <laughs> Laura. Laura. Open your eyes. Yes. What do you see, Laura? I see. I see. Nothing, nothing at all. You were asleep and you had a bad dream. Asleep? Yes. You had one of your headaches, do you remember? And I put you under hypnosis, and then I decided to let you sleep it off. You seem so tired. I feel so strange. I know. The truth is... Well, I'm not sure that you're well. What do you mean? When do you and Jimmy plan to get married? This weekend? I can't help wondering if that's wise. What you... What do you mean? I wonder if you're well enough. You seem so run down and the headaches are obviously worse. Took a long, long time to make you lose the pain. Eric. Jimmy and I are getting married. This Saturday. We're driving to Crompton Lane. And we're getting married by... A justice of the peace. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing. You sure you feel okay, Laura? Yes, I'm all right. You've hardly said a word since we started out. Well, a girl doesn't run out to get married every day of her life. I need uh, time to reflect. You haven't changed your mind, I hope. No. I haven't changed my mind. Well, then what's that cold sweat all about? It's not another one of your headaches, is it? No. It's just nerves. It's bridal jitters. You know, maybe... Maybe if you didn't drive so fast. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm in a hurry. Rip the bell off the door, young man. I'm sorry about that. Uh, my name is Collins. I called this morning about the wedding. Oh, the judge is inside. He's near deaf as a post, so better make the I do's good and loud. <laughs> I intend to. Oh, <clears throat> come in. Come on, come, come, come in, folks. Mom will act as witness. Fine. Uh, young lady, you send uh, uh, here. Next to you, young man. Honey, are you all right? Huh? Oh, yes, I'm fine. You sure you wouldn't like a glass of water? Oh, no. No, thank you. Steady, honey. It only hurts for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Dearly beloved, 
We're gathered together here in the sight of God and the face of his company, trying to gather this man and this woman, holy matrimony. What's wrong? Which is an honorable state instituted by God. A little shortness of breath. Signifying unto us, Mr. Laura. Union, as the church Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned. Oh, and Jimmy. By Jimmy. His What's the matter? I am the command. What? I've got this, this awful pain. This terrible pain. It's raining. Oh, Jimmy. I'm so sorry. Oh, honey, now, come on. Don't be sorry. Just take it easy, that's all. That's what the doctor said. I do feel better now. Much better. Oh, who would have thought the day would turn out like this? Stuck in a cheap motel across the street from the Justice of the Peace. We're not even married yet. It would be deliciously sinful if it weren't for this miserable room. Uh, Jimmy. What is it? Oh, God. Jimmy. Help me. What's the matter, honey? Is the pain again? No. No, it's something else. Jimmy, I, I have to get up. Oh, come on. I have to get up. Bed, darling, you heard the... Doctor. I have to. I have to move. Laura. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy! Good Lord, you hit the wall! I can't stop myself! Oh, Laura, oh, stop! Hold me, Jimmy! Hold me! I can't stop Come myself! Come on, darling, don't fight me! Don't fight me! Stop! Bring yourself around this way! Oh, I can't help it! I can't! I have to move! Stop on the table! Oh, what's happening to me? I have to get I'm control of myself! I, I don't Laura. belong to myself anymore! Laura! I can't tell you how sorry I am, Jimmy, but I uh, also can't say that I'm surprised. Well, what do you mean? Well, my field is anthropology, but I'm not a complete stranger to the psychological sciences. In my opinion, uh, Laura's problem is the result of a conflict, the difference between two worlds, the world of everyday reality and the dark world of superstition. No matter how much she laughs about it now, Laura grew up believing in devils and zombies and voodoo dolls. Come on, I just can't believe that. Well, that's why I feel so strongly that Laura, well, she just isn't ready for marriage. Well, here, let me show you something. What is that? It's a doll. Now, as you can see, it's a uh, very good likeness of Laura. Uh, Prudence is an artist of sorts. Your servant made this? Yes. It's her hobby. It's a sort of sculpture. But um, what do you suppose Laura did when she saw this doll? She screamed. She was horrified. She thought it was a voodoo effigy. And whatever happened to the doll would happen to her. No, Professor, I'm, I'm sorry. I just can't buy that explanation. Yes, I was afraid that you wouldn't. Laura's too sensible. This is all such childish stuff. Would you care to... Test the theory. Test it? How? Yeah. Well, would you be willing to conduct a little experiment? I might. Depends on what it is. All right, I'll tell you. At exactly nine o'clock this evening, I will take our little doll here and bring it to that fireplace. And I'll hold the doll over the flames, high enough so that it won't be scorched, but low enough so that it can feel the heat. Oh, the dolls don't feel No, no. Dolls don't. But Laura is another matter. You tell her what I'm doing. Tell her about the experiment. And then see how she reacts. I'm sorry, I don't like politics, Professor. I just want you to know what you're up against, Jimmy. Now remember, exactly nine o'clock. <laughs> Sometimes, Jimmy, I mean, I know you saw Eric. You told me you were going to. All right, I saw him. And? He just told me a lot of nonsense, that's all. About me? And my father? About you and voodoo dolls. What did he say exactly? Laura, why did he have that doll made? What doll? You know... The one that looks like you. 
What are you... What are you talking about? You said you saw it, didn't you? No. I never saw any such thing, Jimmy. I, he must have been joking. He must have been putting you on. I saw the thing, darling. You what? I saw the doll. It was about this big and obviously hand-carved and... Well, it did look like you, Laura. Same long blonde hair, blue eyes, very much like you. That woman knows how to carve. Woman? You mean Prudence? The servant? Yes, that's what he said. That she made the doll and that you actually think... Laura, you can't believe in voodoo. Not really. Oh, dear God. And that explains it. That explains everything. What? The pain of... In my chest, it was like a... Like the thrust of a needle. Oh, now, come on. And the way I lost control as if I did... Like I was being flung about like a... Like a doll. It was exactly... Like a helpless doll. Now, cut that out. You know that isn't so. You're just convincing yourself of this nonsense. It's all in your mind. But what else explains it, Jimmy? What else? As long as he has that doll, he has me. Shh. Honey, please. That's crazy. You've got to find it, Jimmy. You've got to get that doll away from okay, me. Okay, okay, honey. Just give us a little time. I don't have any time. If something happens to that doll, I'll die. No, Laura, you can't really believe that. I want you to prove that isn't true, and you can tonight. What do you mean? That nutty friend of yours said he was going to try a little experiment tonight just to prove the point to me. Well, I want you to disprove it. What sort of experiment? He said that exactly nine o'clock he was going to take the doll and bring it to the fireplace. Oh, no. He said he was going to hold it over the flames high enough for the doll to feel the heat. And he said you'd feel it, too. Oh, Lord, Jimmy. What time is it? It's uh, 20 of nine. We'll get out of here. No, no. Well, go back to my place and we will prove no. him wrong, darling. Prove him a liar. Oh, God, I, I, I'm getting warm. I'm getting terribly warm, Jimmy. That's your imagination. No, what is... Oh, honey, he said nine... A... Wait a minute. My watch isn't going. Jimmy, look. That clock on the wall, it is not... Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, Jimmy, it's happening. It's really happening. Laura, now don't. Come on, you've got to fight this. It's the only suggestion. It's hypnosis. Oh, he's killing me. Oh. He is burning me alive. Honey, no, darling, no. Stop it, Jimmy. I'm on fire. I'm on fire. Yes, the mind is a powerful weapon. And when it's turned against ourselves, it's the most dangerous weapon on earth. Can Laura Fletcher find a way to stop her own mind from tormenting her and possibly ending her life? At least she isn't alone in the struggle. We'll find out what Laura and Jimmy can do about the deadly doll that menaces her when I return shortly with Act Three. Professor Douglas's experiment has succeeded only too well. And it's also succeeded in convincing Jimmy Collins that something has to be done to save the sanity and even the life of the woman he loves. And that the best place to be in would be the home of Eric Douglas, his servant Prudence, and the doll itself. Oh. Hello, Miss Fletcher. Hello, Prudence. Is Professor Douglas home? No, miss. He's gone. Gone where? On a lecture tour. He took the early morning train not half an hour ago. When do you expect him back? Not for days, he said. Prudence, I have to talk to you. Please let us in. Yes, miss. Prudence, when my fiancé was here the other day, the professor showed him a doll. A doll, miss? He said... You made it. I made no doll, miss. I saw it, Prudence. It was in a black cardboard box about this big. And he took it out of this break front here. I know nothing of a doll, sir. All right. Suppose we look for ourselves. Please, sir. Jimmy, is it there? No, it's empty. Please. 
I cannot allow this. All right, where's the doll, Prudence? I don't know. Please, you have to help me, Prudence. You don't know what he's doing with that doll. He's making voodoo magic with it. Do you understand? I am a Christian, Miss Fletcher. You know what I'm talking about. He's putting a spell on me, Prudence. He's using that doll you made to make me do his bidding. He wants to stop me from marrying. He thinks only of your happiness, miss. You are like his daughter. He is torturing me. Would a father torture his own child? You've got to help us find him, Prudence. You must know where he's staying. I'm sorry. I know nothing. All right. Then the least you can do is give him a message. You tell him for me, for both of us, that his game isn't going to work. That Laura and I are leaving too, and we're not coming back. He'll never see her again. Did you get that? No matter what he does, he'll never see her again. Did you get that? No matter what he does, he will never see Laura again. Prudence? Prudence? Where are you? Here, Professor. Did you have a good tour? Yes. No. I, I don't remember. It was endless. Seems like far more than three days. They were here, Professor. Who? Oh. Miss Fletcher and her young man. They came to see you and to find the doll. You didn't let them? No. It is still hidden. Good. The girl says you are torturing her. Only for her own good, Prudence. I swear that. This man Collins is wrong for her, and I had to prevent the marriage. Why, Professor? Because her father asked me to watch over her to protect her. That's why I asked you to make the doll, so that I could trick her into believing that I had some control over her. Nothing else would have worked. It was not a trick. Of course it was, Prudence. No, Professor. The doll was made because Dambala commands... With her image, her hair, a drop of her blood. Now the girl and the doll have become sharers of the same soul. Prudence, you're slipping back into the jungle. Doll has no powers. Laura reacted only to suggestion. The doll is her. She is the doll. Only the sorcerer can break the spell. I'm tired, Prudence. I can't cope with mumbo-jumbo tonight. Professor... Lift the spell from the dog. Oh, for heaven's sake. There is no such thing, Prudence. Call the girl. Tell her I will ask Dambala Ruida to unchain her spirit from the doll. No. I will not do anything of the kind. Why? Because you don't want her to marry? That's right. Because you want her for yourself. What kind of talk is that? I'm more than twice her age. But you still want her. I have eyes. I have ears. I will call the girl. I will tell her that the doll is here. And that you will lift the spell from it. Stop that. Put that phone down. Now, you stay out of this. You hear me? I made the doll for you. Now I will unmake it evil. I told you to put that phone down. <laughs> oh, Shishama. Here, now stop him. You're scratching my face. Look what you've done, you witch. You've drawn blood. I'm sorry. I didn't mean... You have meddled enough in my life. Now get out of here. I don't want to see your ugly face again. I want you out of here by tomorrow morning. Do you hear me? Yes, Professor. I heard you. <laughs> A moment. Laura. Hello, Eric. You know Jimmy Collins, of course. What are you doing here? Sorry to be such early arrivals, Professor. We wanted to make sure you didn't go off to another uh, lecture this morning. I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Collins. Don't plan to stay long, Professor. Only until you give us that doll. The doll? That's right. <laughs> For heaven's sake, you're, <laughs> you're really serious, aren't you? You really believe that doll has some mysterious powers. It doesn't matter, Eric. I'd just feel better if, you, if you'd let me have it. 
I know it's here. How do you know that? Who told you? Prudence called me. Prudence? Yes, very late last night. She told us that the, the doll is in the hall closet. In a black box. She lied to you. Woman's gone crazy. I had to fire her. You want me to look in the closet, Professor? How dare you? I could have you arrested for what you're doing. Eric, please. We've been friends. Friends for such a, a long friends. time. Friends. That is a beautiful word, isn't it? Friends. Almost as good a word as father. That is all I ever meant for you. Oh, Let's have the doll, Professor. Oh, yes, the doll. The voodoo doll. Mr. Collins, I think that you are as mad as she is. Maybe I am mad, Eric. But I am afraid of the doll. I can't help myself. So please, please let me have it. I'll give you one minute to lead us to the doll, Professor. Oh, and then what will you do? Pump me full of lead? And I'll find it myself. In the course of it, I might break quite a few things. Quite a few things in the process. Things you may value. All right, I will show you the doll. There. Is that what you're after? <gasps> it does look like me. I think I... I think I remember seeing it once before, but... It's as if it was in a dream. I'll take that, Professor. Stop right there! What? Now, suppose I didn't give you the doll. Suppose I smashed its head instead. Eric. All I have to do is smash the head against this wall. One sharp blow, and the Eric. head is broken. The skull Eric. caved in. The pretty blue eyes shut forever. Ah? Huh? Shall I, Laura? Eric, why are you doing this to me? You smashed my life, didn't you? You didn't care what happened to me? Oh, Eric, but I do care. You walked out with him. You left me for him. Well, here's what he... Uh, then... Oh! Uh, a, you, 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 Laura. Uh, Eric, what's the matter? Uh, Jimmy, what's the matter with him? Uh, my chest... Uh, uh, Jimmy! It's a heart attack. I think he's dead. Oh! <gasps> Oh, my God. Are you sure? Look at his face. Oh, no. There's no sign of a pulse. He's gone, Laura. Oh, no. Lord, just like that. Must have been the excitement. No, it was not. Prudence. The spell is lifted, miss. When the sorcerer dies, the spell dies with him. What's that in her hand? Prudence, what are you doing with that knife? It was the only way, Miss. Wait a minute. She's got something else, some some kind of doll. Prudence, you, you didn't. His skin and his blood from my fingernails. His curse from my lips and heart. Oh, Jimmy. How horrible. She killed him. Oh, no, no, Laura, no. It, it was a coronary. Only a coronary. I think. Well, personally, I don't think I'll ever trust a doll again. Not Raggedy Ann, or Betsy Wetsy, or even that paper doll they used to sing about. Of course, there's no question in my mind that Professor Douglas died of natural causes as opposed to supernatural. There's a great deal to be said for the power of suggestion, which, of course, is why you're about to hear the following suggestion. We hope that the story you just heard hasn't given you any ideas. That you're not all rushing out to the local toy store to buy up their supply of dolls in order to try some grisly experiments on your least loved ones. Take our word for it. It doesn't really work. But on the other hand, why do I have this sticking pain in my left shoulder? Our cast included Joanne Linville, Ross Martin, Virginia Gregg, and Carl Swenson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.
Now, a preview of our next tale. Well, I don't know if it was the gin or a strange kind of sickness that they found him one morning hanging upsides down from his veranda rail, crazy as a loon, carrying on about someone watering his cobra. He died in a convulsion. Oh, was it thought to be the island? Oh, no proof. But the next man, Vigors, shot his head, blew his head right off. And the first of the line of the Benton Far East Company, old Adams, he just plain up and disappeared as though that damn tropical forest reached out like a, a octopus and swatted him. Oh, line and sink here. Uh, no, sir. No, sir, Mr. Witcher, traitor or not, promotion with your company or whatever. Uh, you wouldn't get Captain Ben Randall here to set one foot on the beach at Palace Ah. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. On July 24, 1915, Gray Stevens was more excited than she could remember. She was getting ready for her company picnic. Grace worked for the Chicago-based Western Electric Company for the past three years and considered herself lucky to have secured such a position. Grace was born in 1891 in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Her family moved to the Rockton, Illinois area where her parents, Winfield and Bell, rented a farm. Winfield passed away in 1907, when he was 48, and the family moved to Rockford, Illinois to look for work. Grace's brother Alvy seemed to have trouble finding a job. It must have seemed like the family's fortunes had finally turned when Grace got the job with the Western Electric Company in 1912. The family moved to Chicago when Grace was offered the job. Western Electric had quite a reputation for splurging on their employees for their annual party. This was a highlight of the year for most of these workers. It meant a special treat for the whole family for the married folks. As far as the non-married employees were concerned, it was an opportunity to meet other eligible men and women. The single women got together to shop for new dresses and hats. They also would help style each other's hair and to dress. The company hired five boats to carry their workers across Lake Michigan to Michigan City for the day. They warned folks to arrive early, and Grace took the warning to heart. She waited for her turn to walk up the gangplank and board the USS Eastland, 
the first boat scheduled to leave the dock from downtown Chicago. Even though it was just a little after 7 in the morning, the celebration had already begun. There was a band playing as the passengers walked on board. People boarding were shouting and waving to folks already on the ship. Over 7,000 tickets were sold for this day-long excursion, and the crew of the Eastland made sure that every available space was filled. There were even federal inspectors along to make sure of the count for each ship. The 275-foot boat normally carried 2,500 passengers, plus the crew, but on this day the number reached higher. Some of the families with younger children headed below decks so the little ones couldn't wander off in the party-like atmosphere on the deck. Up top, folks were scrambling for seats and leaning on the rails to wave to the people left on the dock. By 7.15 a.m., the ship was filled to capacity, and though the passengers didn't notice, it had begun to list away from the wharf. The ship listed only for a short while this time, but within a few more minutes, the first of a long list of small warning signs began. By 7.23 a.m., the Eastland began to list once again. This time, water started to enter the engine room and some of the crew climbed up ladders to the main deck. Within a few more minutes, the list had shifted to 45 degrees. Furniture began to slide, causing injuries to some of the passengers. Water also poured into the portholes in the cabins below. Each of these incidents would lead to one of the worst shipwrecks in the history of the Great Lakes. The next time the Eastland started to list, she didn't stop. The boat rolled slowly onto its side. The people on deck were thrown into the water. Their clothes soon weighed them down, making it impossible to tread water. Folks below deck were trapped in their rooms as doors and passageways were blocked by shifting furniture. Whole families tried to make their way off the sinking ship as the water poured inside. One eyewitness said that after the boat flipped, there was a full minute of silence, like no one could believe what they had just seen. Then the screams began. By 7.30 that morning, the boat was completely on its side in 20 feet of water, still tied to the dock. It had rolled over so quickly there was no time to use the life-saving equipment that was on the Eastland. This was a busy Saturday morning, and hundreds if not thousands of people were on the docks conducting business. They quickly began to pull folks from the water almost immediately. There was no lack of heroes on this day. The water was a mass of people trying to stay afloat. There was a lot of chaos as the air filled with shouting and screaming. One eyewitness, Harlan Babcock, was a reporter for the Chicago Herald. He stated in his article about the tragedy, in an instant, the surface of the river was black with struggling, crying, frightened, drowning humanity. We infants floated about like corks. One can only imagine the horror of the moment as parents tried to save their children and spouses, only to watch as they slipped under the water for the final time. Later, many of these family members would be found clasped in each other's arms. The survivors would mention the sounds of people's screams. Even years later, they would talk of hearing those screams in their nightmares. Men with boats launched them to save as many survivors as they could reach. Others pulled the injured ones from the wreckage and commandeered cars and wagons to take them to local hospitals. One of the many selfless helpers on this July day was Helen Reba. Helen was on the way to the docks to catch one of the boats for the outing. She was a nurse who worked for Western Electric. She jumped aboard a passing ambulance and made her way quickly to the docks. She too mentioned the sounds of screaming. Helen rushed onto the hull of the overturned ship to help pull the survivors from the water and through the portholes of the ship. Some were badly injured. Helen arranged for blankets to be sent from the nearby Marshall Fields store. She also called local restaurants and had them bring soup and hot coffee to the scene and to the hospitals for the staff. In the end, 844 people died in the disaster, including 22 whole families. The dead were carried to 2nd Regiment Armory, which had been turned into a makeshift morgue. The dead were lined up in rows so their family members could walk down the aisle to find their loved ones. Unfortunately, some folks who came through were more interested in grabbing jewelry from the corpses than helping to identify them. One of the dead was Grace Stevens. 
her mother and brother had to walk up and down the aisles of the dead until they could find her. The investigation of the sinking of the Eastland started even before all the dead were removed from the area. There were many aspects to the investigation of this ship. This was only a few years after the sinking of the Titanic. One of the changes that had resulted from that tragedy was that every boat needed enough lifeboats to carry 75% of the people on board. The Eastland carried 11 lifeboats, 37 life rafts, and 2,570 life preservers to accommodate for their passengers. Since the boat had been made in 1902, before this new rule, all these items needed to fit somewhere. The crew eventually stored all these items on the deck, causing it to become top-heavy. This would surely have contributed to the sinking that day, but the Eastland had its share of issues even before the new rules. In fact, some sailors claimed the ship was cursed from the start and called her a hoodoo vessel. Several good books have been written about the sinking and mention close calls through the years. One such near disaster took place in 1904 when she had 3,000 people on board and another in 1906 with 2,530 passengers. One crew member described the Eastland like riding a bicycle, wobbly at first, then steady as she got underway. Donations for the families poured into the American Red Cross and they dispersed the money to the family members after an interview with each family. Bell and Alvy Stevens were given $102 from Grace's life insurance, $126 from emergency relief, and $630 from donations. In today's money, it would be about $20,000. The Western Electric Company also changed its hiring practice after the tragedy and gave first priority to anyone who had a family member killed in the accident. Alvy was given his sister's spot in the company. The headlines of the local newspapers mentioned this hometown girl who'd been killed in the horrible tragedy. They also mentioned that her mother and brother traveled with Grace's body so they could lay her to rest beside her father in the Rockton, Illinois Cemetery. Despite research, there are no records to tell of what happened to Alvy and Belle after Grace's death. Neither is mentioned in the records for the Rockton Cemetery. When Weird Darkness Returns In November 1978, four employees at a hamburger restaurant are kidnapped and murdered. Almost 45 years later, seven employees at a fried chicken establishment are found slain, their bodies found in the restaurant's walk-in freezer. One case found justice, the other is still waiting. Plus, it was 1973, and the small town of Murfreesboro, Illinois, had quite a scare, with numerous people encountering what many described as a large, gorilla-like creature. We might call it Bigfoot or Sasquatch. They called it a big, muddy monster. These stories are up next. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. 
Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla. The only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. The National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. For some people, there is only one chase and no other exists. The chase to secure and hold money. Nothing, nothing else matters. There is no love except for pennies, dimes, and dollars, and only hate for those who would deprive them of it. Hear those footsteps? A man running down a street in a cheap section of a city just after nightfall. Watch him. He's leading us to just such people. He darts across a narrow street without looking. He comes to the intersection of a street and alley just as a car turns the corner. Hey, you hit him. How bad? He's dead. What are we going to do? Do? Get out of here. Drag him in that alley. Yeah, but he's dead. That's hit and run. We ought to do You some... hurt me. Drag him in that alley. Let's get out of here. Yes, the man lying dead in the alley marked the beginning of a story. A very important story to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, Albert and Carolyn... Two lovely people who run a boarding house a few blocks away. It's a vital story to them because it involves money. And anything that involves money is more important than life itself to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And another thing, Albert. You gotta go up and see Mr. Sedgwick right this minute. Because he ain't paid his rent for next week. He's a new boarder. And it's best that we show him right off that we ain't gonna put up with back rent. Well... Be a lot better if we get that Mr. Sedgwick out of here. I don't like the looks of him. Besides, he burns the electric a lot at night. Oh, it's getting so two honest people ain't able to run a decent, respectable place no more. Mm. Well, anyhow, you go right up and see that Mr. Sedgwick. It ain't right. Uh, who's there? Your star boarder, Mr. Campion. Uh, all right. Good evening, Albert. Carolyn? You ain't to call us by our first names. I told you that. Oh, merely a friendly gesture on my part, Mr. Crocky. But I did not descend into these charming quarters of yours to discuss the amenities of nomenclature. Now, now, stop that fancy talk. And don't bring that cigarette in here. You ain't been smoking in bed. No, but, uh, it's an idea. At least the feeble glow would provide more light than the ceiling fixture. Oh, you complaining again? Now, you look here, Mr. Uppity Campion. You're getting a good room at a reasonable rent. There ain't many boarding houses in the city. No, where you no, could go no, and... no, 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 you're perfectly right. There aren't many boarding houses in the city where the boarders have to race home at night to make sure they can get their own evening paper. Or where the owners get up at four in the morning to steal the cream off the top of the milk. Are you calling us thieves? No, I don't think so, Mrs. Crocky. I'd have to qualify that. 
Sneak thieves, I should say. You? You? Oh, now, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it. Let's, let's, don't argue about it. Well, now, what about the hot plate in my room? What's the matter with it? Well, it belies its name, Mr. Crocky. It is no longer a hot plate. It has become a refrigerator. You broke it. In the passage of time, sweet Carolyn, mechanical and electrical appliances do get out of order. But we can't get parts, Mr. Campion. All right. Let's go on to something else. The, uh, the bedspread, for example. It's become one of the most exciting games I've ever played to find a spot in the spread free from holes. It embarrasses me when I have guests. Oh, we can't afford a new one, Mr. Campion. All right. We shall forget the bedspread and take up the subject of the ceiling fixture. Uh, that ain't broke. Well, no, no, not exactly. But it certainly is eccentric. It goes on and off, Mr. Crocky, like a lighthouse. No human hand touches it, and yet it flashes ambitiously, energetically. Ah, well, you keep finding fault with everything. Oh, but I'm not alone, friend Crocky. I am not alone. I heard Miss Barton complaining earlier tonight about her sink. It's her fault. She combs her hair over it, and the hair falls in and blocks the drain. Yes, but... Oh, <laughs> I give up. Such slippery and adroit excuse-making is beyond my power of refutation. Uh, what? Nothing, nothing at all. Well, now that I've registered my complaint, I shall retire to the damp chill of the crypt I occupy, and for which I pay $68 a month. If you don't like it, you can get out. Well, that, Mrs. Crocky, is a line which becomes you so well. Good night, young puppy. For two cents, I... Two cents? Such extravagance, Mr. Crocky, and from you, all people. Good night. Well, I... Albert, as soon as we can. We'll put him out. No, 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 Carolyn. Carolyn, uh, it might be hard to rent that room. Yeah, he does pay regular. Well... Hmm. Oh... Hmm? Mr. Sedgwick. Huh? You go right on up there and get the money for Mr. Sedgwick. Now, oh, Carolyn, now maybe he'll bring it down. The night ain't over yet. You're scared of him. Well, I don't like, like the way he looks at me. We'll both go. Well, all right. There goes that Miss Barton. Run the water again to wash your hair. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Miss Barton, you close off that water good. And don't use too much. <laughs> there. She knows all right. Her being a day behind with the rent. <laughs> Mr. Sedgwick? Mr. Sedgwick? Your lovely knuckles, Carolyn. You'll but... skin them. You shut up. Or wouldn't you rather I told you that Mr. Sedgwick went out? How do you know? I saw him leave his room and go out the front door some time ago. Now go away and stop pounding. I have work to do. I'd like to slap that smart alecky Mr. Campion's face for him. No, 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 never mind, Carolyn. Let's go for our walk. Uh, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, you are a remarkable couple. You do take the cream from the milk, and you do read the newspapers before the boarders get home to save a couple of pennies. And now you go for your walk. Oh, not for exercise, though. It's to save electric light bills. Every night it's the same. Down the same street, past the warehouse... Over to the brewery and along the street running through the wholesale district until you finally get sleepy and turn homeward. Albert, if that smart Mr. Campion tells you that he ain't used an electric light in that lamp he bought, he's lying. If you could just catch him at it. 
He's got enough light in his room. He don't need no more lamps. It's costing us money to put up with him. That's right, Albert. Oh, oh, money, money. We always got troubles. Uh, wait, wait a minute. It's a man laying there. Yes. Mm, drunk, most likely. That's right. Honest people have to slave for their money, and something no good like this drinks it up. I don't then... smell no liquor. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to look closer. Keep away from him, Albert. Maybe it's a trap. He might be a hold-up man. Carolyn. It's Mr. Sedgwick. It is. Look. What's the matter with him? He, he's dead. Albert. Looks like maybe he got hit by an auto. He, What's that? His pocket. It's stuffed with money. And him owing oh, us rent. Hm. But look, look, Carolyn. It's, it's so, 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 so much. Albert. What, what, what do you suppose? Shh. Ain't nobody in sight. It's so much money. Like as not he come by it bad. I never did like the way he looked. Like, like one of them gangsters. Uh, he wouldn't do no good oh, with it. Oh, he owes us rent. It's his kind that would spend it on some chorus girl. Uh, you and me, we... Albert, Albert, you gonna do it? Or ain't you? No, there ain't nobody watching. Ain't nobody saw him before us either. Or there wouldn't be no money. Albert. No. Come on, come on. I got it. So you've taken the money from Mr. Sedgwick, Calbert and Carolyn. But look, isn't someone behind you? Faster. Walk faster. Just a shadow, wasn't it? But you didn't know that, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. That money is heavy in your pocket, isn't it, Albert? Faster now, both of you. Hurry home to hide the money in the mattress. Yes, in the mattress with the rest of your miser's hoard. But faster again. The memory of Mr. Sedgwick lying back there is pursuing you, and you've got to get away. Faster now. Faster. <gasps> Did you, Albert? No, no, I... I got it right here. Oh, got it. Get into our room now. Put it in the mattress. Well, well... Uh, Mr. Camp. Back early, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Were you expecting someone else? No. No, I wasn't. Well, what have yeah. you been doing? Running? No. Why should we be running? Well, I don't know. You might have heard the Nikolai dropped upstairs and were chasing each other to see who'd get it. You you ain't funny, Mr. Campion. I, I wasn't trying to be funny, Albert. Oh, you shut up. Well, what's the matter with you two? Mr. Crocky ain't feeling good. As a matter of fact, he does look a little pale around the gills. Someone's been chasing you. No, nobody chased Why us. Why did you ask that? Well, from the way you dashed in here, I thought perhaps you'd robbed a bank or something. We're honest people. To, uh, to a certain extent, yes. Are you calling us thieves again? I explained that once before tonight. But you two certainly do look excited. And the only thing that could bring a flush to your careworn cheeks would be money. Perhaps left by a rich uncle. We ain't got any uncle. And that ain't no way to talk, Mr. Campion. Okay. Okay, we'll forget it. I'm going for a walk. Walk? Well, sure, sure. Why not? Ceiling fixture gave up the ghost altogether a few minutes ago. I can't work anymore. Which way are you walking? Well, does that make any difference? No, of course not. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a damp out. <laughs> Might catch a chill. You know, your solicitude is amazing. Can this be the crockies? The same people who all through the winter dole out heat by fractions of degrees? Uh, 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 Mr. Campion, 
That ceiling fixture. Uh, I got some wire. Uh, maybe we could fix it. Tell me, is your name by any chance Scrooge? Who? What Marley's ghost accosted you along the way and forced you into a recognition of the error of your way? Huh? In other words, what the devil happened outside? Uh, nothing. Nothing. You want that light fixed, do you? Well, unless I'm to become a mole, light would be welcome, yes. Then you go right along with Mr. Crocky, Mr. Campion. Ah. Uh-huh. What's the matter? I see. See what? Mr. Crocky has What have the... I got? The wire, the wire, the wire to fix the ceiling fixtures. And if I help him, it saves the electrician's fee for you. You're always poking fun at us. Oh, no, Mrs. Crocky. No, indeed. But, uh... Come along, Albert. You and I shall play Steinmetz to the ceiling fixture. Oh, and Mrs. Crocky. Huh? I should still like to know what encounter brought you to home before sleep deadened your elfin steps and dulled those brilliant minds. Uh, you coming, Mr. Campion? Certainly, Mr. Crocky. Albert, hmm? you better leave that package with me. Oh, I, I forgot. Package? Albert, give it to me. I'm going to leave you alone with it. Uh, Mr. Campion. Yes, Albert. Um, there's wire and stuff in the cellar. Now, you get it yourself. Uh, uh, here. Here's the key to the basement. Oh, no. Wonder of wonders. The key to the crocky cellar. And shall I find vintage 192? Or perhaps the skeletons of former boarders? You, uh, you fixed a light, Mr. Campion. If there's anything you need, you can buy it tomorrow. We'll pay you for it. Numb. Absolutely numb, I am. This is the epitome of surprise. The key to the cellar, an offer of payment by the Crockies, all in one evening. Oh, I shall certainly write this to Mr. Ripley. Nay, nay, I shall insist upon another time capsule sunk into the ground to record this event for posterity. You're going to fix it or not? Oh, certainly, certainly. Tomorrow I may see the Crockies back in usual form. Therefore, tonight I shall gather the golden fruits of whatever occasion this... Munificent behavior. Callan, you're a fool. You mentioned package, and it ain't in the package. I want to see how much is there. We could have counted it later. How do I know that you wouldn't have took some for yourself? Oh, you shut up. Come on. We'll count it in our room. So you count the money, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And how much is there? A hundred? Keep counting. Three hundred? Oh, much more. Five hundred and seven? A thousand? Keep counting. Perspiration is beating your foreheads. Your hands are damp. The bills stick to your fingers. Now you reach two thousand. They're all hundreds. One zero zero on each bill. Two thousand. Three. Thirty five hundred and you're not through yet. Keep counting, counting, your breath hot, your eyes glazed with greed. Ah, now you're finished counting. Five, five thousand dollars. <laughs> we found it. We, we, we just found it. We went for a walk. We found it. Not so loud. You'll wake everybody. <laughs> We're in. Cedric gets run over by a hit and run driver, and we get his money. Shh, shh, shh. Uh, who's there? Uh, Campion. Is anything wrong? No, there's nothing the matter. But I thought I heard Mrs. Crocky. Uh, did you did you fix the light? Oh yes, yes. Uh, wait a minute. I got the key to the cellar. Uh, put it under the door. Put it under the door. Quiet. Just shove it under. Okay, but are you sure there's nothing wrong? Now just go to bed. I'm going out for a walk. If anyone calls, I'll be back in half an hour. Yeah, but he can't go. Maybe you go the way we did and you'll see him. Did you hear me? Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes? Uh, it's, um, it's awful chilly out. Well, if you'll observe closely, I'm the possessor of an overcoat and a rather serviceable Benny, which... Wouldn't you like a nice cup of tea? I beg your pardon. You, you like tea, don't you, Mr. Campion? I, I don't understand. And uh, tomorrow we can pick up a second-hand hot plate for you. Yeah, sure. We'll get you a new one. Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, please t- take, take a very close look at me. 
My name is Campion. I have been living here for six months, during which time you must have seen that I am not affluent in any way. I have no influence with the governor. I know no politicians. I know no statesmen. What little money I have, I spend for bare necessities. In short, Albert, Carolyn... Why are you spreading this soft soap with such a lavish hand? Well, we're willing to let bygones be bygones. Oh? Well, thank you very much for the offer of tea, but I shall take a walk just the same. He'll go the way we did. I know he will. I can't. Now close the door. And what if he does? All he'll see is that Sedgwick lay in the alley. We didn't kill him. Anybody could see it was an auto that done it. And Campion can't know about the money he had. Sedgwick was only here a few days. But but we got to hide it. In case. In the mattress with the rest. Oh, we ain't got time. Hmm? What if Mr. Campion does know about the money? What if he sees Mr. Sedgwick and he comes back here? We ain't got time to open the mattress and close it again. Well, the mattress is the best place. All our money has always been safe no, in the mattress. No, no, no time. I'm... Um, Put it in the fireplace until tomorrow morning. And then what? Well, uh, when the bank's open, you, you go clear over to the other side of town. If it's a nice day, you can walk. Um, change one of the big bills into little ones. You're crazy. What good's that going to do? You'll, you'll see. Now, now listen. And then go to another bank and put the little bills in the bank account. Oh, we ain't got none. You can open one. Maybe do the same thing for a week until all the money is out of here. They ain't nobody knows us on the other side of town. Yeah. I see. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> then when we're good and sure that nobody else knows about the money, uh -huh. we can take it out of the bank. Then bring it back here. <laughs> That's smart. Pretty smart, Carolyn. I bet even Mr. Smarty Pants Campion couldn't think of nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a splendid idea, Albert and Carolyn. You sigh with relief and settle to sleep, which you can't. Then it's morning. You leave the house, Albert, and your pocket is a hundred-dollar bill. You start for a bank across town, a bank where no one knows you. You reach the bank, give the bill to one of the tellers. He looks at you, hard. Is there some suspicion in his glances? Is there, Albert? But he changes the bill, and you hurry out. You start for another bank blocks away. But before you get there, a newspaper headline catches your eye. You can't read it all, but two words make you start and turn pale. Bank robbery. You read as much as you can, but your lifelong miserliness doesn't let you spend a nickel for that paper. One phrase strikes your eye. Marked money. Now you hurry home. The other bank is forgotten. You should take a taxi. But you don't think of it, even though fives and tens are clutched in your pocket. The dampness from your hand making them a pulpy mess. Now you're home. Safe. Uh, I can't stop now, Mr. Campion. Okay, so you can't stop, but don't you don't you want to know why this policeman is here? P policeman? Where? Using the phone down the hall. It seems our good friend, Mr. Sedgwick, has some shady dealings. Sedgwick? Well, well yes, you see. The... I, I gotta go to Carolyn. I, I went out to get some medicine. No, no, well, the, the law will wait, Mr. Crockett. The law will wait. Carolyn! Carolyn! Is, is, is the policeman gone, Albert? No, he ain't. I saw him coming down the street while I was looking out the window for you. I didn't say nothing. Then I heard the policeman and Mr. Campion talking. Now, you tell me what they were saying. I couldn't hear it good. I put my ear up against the door. I, I couldn't hear nothing but low talk. Oh, the money. That's what he's here for. That's what he's here for. Where's the rest of it? Still in the fireplace. I'll get it. Are they going to arrest us, Albert? Oh, are they going to arrest us for taking the money from Sedgwick? The newspaper said it was marked. The bandit took marked money from the bank. The oh. serial numbers was all wrote down. That Mr. Sedgwick must have stolen it. Now we got it. Oh. We, we got to give it back. Here, here, take it. You're crazy. Then we got to admit we took it off Sedgwick. Sedgwick, he was a crook. We got to get rid of this money. Albert, what are you doing? Burning it. Oh! 
Let go oh! my arm. Let go my arm. The fellow at the bank, he looked oh, funny at me. He it. must have called the police when I left oh. the bank. You're burning oh, it. You're you shut burning up. it. It's all burning. Shut up. up. Oh. Albert, Albert, you didn't have to hit me. You didn't have to hit me. Shh, quiet. That's a policeman. You keep him away. Money's nearly gone. Then he can come in. Go ahead. Don't stand there like a fish. Go ahead. Who? Who, who is it? Champion with a stout minion of the law. Name of, uh... Um, he says his name is McCarthy. All right. Just a couple of seconds more. Just a couple of seconds. I, I, I ain't dressed. Oh, come, 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 Mrs. Crocky. It's after ten. You were up early this morning. I heard you. Uh, it's done, Carolyn. Now you can let him in. Well, Albert and Carolyn, your chase is won, isn't it? You thought it was your lucky night that your good friend Mr. Sedgwick lying dead in the alley would turn out to be a profitable investment after all. You thought you'd be able to stuff his money into your mattress with the rest of your hoard, didn't you? But there were too many strings attached to that $5,000. That's why you're relieved now as you watch the last of it smolder in the grate as the door opens to admit Sergeant McCarthy and Mr. Campion. Well, what is it, officer? What about Mr. Sedgwick? Well, when we found his body lying there in the alley, we had to find out where he was staying. That's why I'm here. Now, you say he's been living here, eh? Only for two days. Mm -hmm. We didn't know nothing about him. Well, of course, honest folks wouldn't. I uh, had a record a yard long and more aliases than you could shake a stick at. As soon as I read about the bank robbery, I said to Carolyn, that Sedgwick is the kind of man who looks like a robber. Sedgwick mm -hmm. a bank robber? Is that right, Sergeant? Oh, Lord, no, Mr. Campion. Small stuff with Sedgwick's line, sneak even. Why, he'd sneak little stuff out of hotel rooms in boarding houses. Say, is there anything missing from here? Trinkets or some cash, eh? No, nothing we know of. Ah, good, good. No, Sedgwick was no bank robber. Uh, besides, the bank robbery you read about is all cleared up. All the money's recovered. No, that's not right. Well, it's all in the morning papers. Uh, but Crockies never buy newspapers, Sergeant McCarthy. Papers cost a whole nickel. Sedgwick had $5,000. 5000 Well, how do you know? He had it, we know. Not a penny on him when we found him. You say that he robbed hotels and boarding houses? Yes. Albert... Carolyn, did you by any chance keep money in your room here? Well, now, did you? The mattress! Here, the mattress! It's been slid open! Our savings, our own money! It's gone! You, you burned our money! Oh, you fool, you burned our own money! <laughs> Our own. Cedric stole our money. We got it back just by luck. But you burned it. You burned our own money. All our savings. All those years of scrimping and saving. And you burned it. Our own money. Oh. <laughs> In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. This story was by Russell Hughes. Heard in the cast were Virginia Payne, Arnold Moss, Martin Rudy, and Louis Van Ruten. The chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, greed and avarice join the pursuit for a hidden fortune when you listen to The Million Dollar Chase.
Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. On Friday, November 17, 1978, four employees of a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana, went missing. Originally, it was believed that this was a simple case of petty theft that scared away the employees. However, the next day, it became clear that this robbery kidnapping escalated into a quadruple homicide. By Sunday, November 19, 1978, the murdered bodies of Jane Freet, Daniel Davis, Mark Flemons and Ruth Ellen Shelton were discovered in the rural woods of Johnson County, 40 minutes away from the restaurant. On that fateful night, four young employees were going through the closing routine at the Burger Chef at 5724 Crawfordsville Road. Three of the workers were still in high school, probably talking amongst themselves about upcoming projects and homework they still had to complete for class. The employees on site were Jane Freet, 20 years old. Jane was an assistant manager for the Burger Chef restaurant. She had recently transferred to the Speedway location after working for three years at another Burger Chef location. She was known for being involved in many activities and was considered a hard worker. She was kidnapped and murdered. Mark Flemons, 16 years old. His friends and family say he was funny and friendly. Mark was the youngest of seven children and grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. As a sophomore who attended Speedway Indiana High School, Mark was happy to be a member of the school's band. He, too, was kidnapped and murdered. Daniel Davis, 16 years old. Daniel, or Danny as his friends called him, had just started his job as a cook and had not even collected his first paycheck from Burger Chef. Danny attended Decatur Central High School. He was a sophomore and a member of the school's Latin club. He expressed an interest in photography and wanted to join the Air Force after high school. He was quiet and kept his circle of friends small, but was enthusiastic about his interests. He was kidnapped and murdered as well. And finally, Ruth Ellen Shelton, 17 years old. She was on the honor roll, and her family said she was brilliant and driven. Ruth had dreams of becoming a computer scientist. She was attending what is now the University of Indianapolis to earn some early college credits. Ruth also enjoyed music, as she was a member of the West Side Church of the Nazarene Choral Group. Like the others, Ruth was also kidnapped and murdered. It was about 11 p.m. when the perpetrators slipped through the back door and ambushed the four employees present. Little is known about what went on inside the restaurant when the two perpetrators broke in, but investigators have come up with a substantial timeline regarding what else happened that night. The Burger Chef restaurant closed at 11 p.m. like usual. The four employees were still scheduled to stay a few more hours to go through the closing routine, clean, and prepare the restaurant for the next day's opening shift. Initially, Mark Flemons was not scheduled to work, but decided to cover his co-worker, Ginger Anderson, who went on a date with another employee, Brian Kring. By 11.45, Brian and Ginger were in the area, so the pair drove past the restaurant and noticed Jane's car wasn't there despite the lights and the back door being ajar. At first, Brian didn't think anything of it, so he proceeded to drop Ginger off back to her house and then drove back to the Burger Chef location to check up on his friends and co-workers. Upon his arrival, Brian noticed that all four employees were nowhere to be found. Walking through the restaurant, he saw that the cash register was on the floor, empty, and there were the personal effects of his co-workers left in the office. Brian knew something was wrong, so he called the police. 
When investigators arrived, a report was filed, but the scene was never properly processed. Since Jane's 1974 Chevrolet Vega was not in the parking lot and the register was cleaned out, the investigators assumed that the employees skipped out on work, banned together to steal money, and got into Jane's car to make a clean getaway. So instead of processing the scene and treating everything as suspicious, the restaurant was cleared to open for business the next day. The investigators failed to consider the essential clues like the employees' belongings left behind and the back door to the restaurant being left open, a door that was rarely ever used by employees. Any vital evidence of what actually took place was accidentally destroyed in the cleaning process, and no photos were taken that night because they simply didn't believe it was a crime scene. Buddy Elwanger, an investigator with the police force, is quoted as saying, "...we screwed up the investigation from the beginning," referring to how the scene was handled. To add insult to injury, we know the only photo taken to the restaurant was one that morning shift employees took after the restaurant was wiped clean before customers began arriving, making the photo completely useless. By 4 a.m. that following morning, Jane's unlocked car was discovered near the Speedway police station, filled with unusual cigarette butts. Suddenly, the police begin to suspect foul play, and a widespread search is launched. It isn't until November 19, 1978, two days later, when the bodies of all four victims were discovered near Johnson County Woods by a couple who lived in White River Township, located approximately 15 miles from the Burger Chef location. Each of the young adults were still wearing their brown and orange polyester Burger Chef uniforms, with the blood on them all dried up. Ruth and Danny were found lying face down just off a gravel path. Both had been shot, execution style, in the head and neck with a 38 caliber revolver. They were discovered side by side, indicating to officers that they were killed at the same time. Police theorized that after Ruth and Danny were shot, Jane and Mark ran for it. Jane's body was found 50 to 75 yards away. She'd been repeatedly stabbed so violently that the knife's blade broke off inside her chest, with the handle nowhere to be found. Mark was found farthest from the others and closest to the main road. He was on his back near a creek. Mark had sustained blunt force trauma to his face and ultimately choked on his own blood. The police believe Mark was disoriented and may have ran into a tree, accidentally stunning him before being beaten with an unknown chain-like object. Police have been wrestling with what would turn the perpetrators from trespassers to thieves, to kidnappers, to killers. Did one of the workers recognize one of the men? Was this premeditated or a crime that spiraled out of control? Interestingly, the crime scene investigation team found watches and money still on all the victims, leaving police to wonder if there was another motive beyond robbery. There are still too many questions left without answers. By November 23rd, Indiana State Police created a designated tip line which created an outpouring of tips, but none of them were credible leads. However, the police had one thing to go off of. An anonymous eyewitness came forward and gave descriptions of the two men they saw suspiciously hanging around the Burger Chef restaurant before the attack. The next day, police released clay busts of the two potential suspects. This marked the first time that Indiana State Police used this method to aid an investigation. Then in 2018, Indiana State Police released an image of the knife's blade that was used in the crime. While there were several suspects and arrests made during the investigation, the case remains unsolved. Almost 45 years later, and just over 200 miles away, a similar tragedy took place in Palatine, Illinois at a Brown's Chicken restaurant. Many crimes get media attention for a short time before seemingly disappearing into the annals of time. That is not so for the infamous Brown's Chicken Massacre, one of the most gruesome and horrific events to ever occur in Chicagoland. Seven people working at the fast food chain were found dead in a freezer at the restaurant in Palatine. All seven employees had been executed. The crime, which remained unsolved for nearly a decade, 
sent the community into a frenzy and puzzled the local police force. The deceased included the owners of the restaurant, Richard E. Ellenfelt and his wife Lynn W. Ellenfelt, of Arlington Heights. Also dead were five of their employees, Guadalupe Maldonado, 46 years old, Palatine High School students Michael C. Castro, 16, and Rico L. Solis, 17, and Thomas Menace, 32, and Marcus Nelson, 31. Six were found shot to death, while another had been brutally stabbed. The bodies of the seven victims were discovered piled on top of one another. Two men, James Degorski and Juan Luna, were eventually charged with the crime at Brown's Chicken and Pasta, and as of this recording are currently serving life sentences behind bars. But the case remained unsolved until 2002, despite numerous leads over the years that followed. That's when investigators got a break in the case as the ex-girlfriend of one of the killers came forward to police. Ann Lockett said she had been threatened by Degorski not to go to the authorities with the details of what had happened, or she also would be killed. Eventually, though, Lockett did tell police what she knew, and it led to the arrests of Degorski and Luna, who was a former employee of the restaurant. I think it was honestly the guilt, Lockett told the Daily Herald newspaper. It wasn't necessarily that they got away with the crime, it was the fact that these people, the victims' families, their kids, their parents, were suffering. Human DNA extracted from a preserved piece of chicken found at the murder scene also helped solve the case. Retired Palatine police officer Brian Opitz said in an interview, ultimately the chicken is what saved us in terms of, you know, we had the foresight to freeze that. It took six years before we got the DNA, but it took another three years after that before we figured out whose DNA it was. The case has been featured on numerous true crime podcasts and television news programs over the years. It also drastically hindered the bottom line at the entire Brown's Chicken franchise, based out of Elmhurst, Illinois, which saw sales plummet, bankruptcy, and eventually the closure of over 100 restaurants across Chicagoland, including the Palatine location where the slayings took place. Following its closure, a dry cleaning business took over, but it was short-lived. The building was eventually demolished in 2001, and the site remained vacant for another decade until a Chase Bank opened there. Still, at least these families have some justice and closure in that the murderers were caught and are serving life sentences. We can only hope that someday the families of the Burger Chef victims in Speedway, Indiana can find the same. It is the dark and lonely road. You drive, you're tired and falling asleep behind the wheel. The windows are down, the cool air blowing through your hair as you crank up the stereo. ACDC blares on the radio and you're screaming out the chorus. Then a set of headlights emerges from the darkness and your night has become a nightmare. Welcome to Last Exit, an anthology of 17 horrific tales where life on the road can sometimes take a dark and unexpected turn. Last Exit by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Now M and J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Stranger. Uh, uh, do have a seat, won't you? Uh, there. Uh, you seem a bit hot. 
let me fetch you a glass of lemonade. There, there you are. It is refreshing, isn't it? Yes. Well, uh, allow me to introduce myself. I am Chet Chatter. I am the morgue attendant here. Uh, and it uh, gets a bit lonely. Yeah. And that is why whenever I receive visitors, I enjoy telling them stories. I would love to tell you one, if you have the time. Oh, well, good. Well, now, let's see. I think today I will tell you about a man named Elma Corn. I have many stories about this man. By trade, Mr. Corn is a manure hauler from Biloxi. However, he seems to have a knack for getting himself into some unusual situations. Well, now, my story begins one summer morning, on a Tuesday, I believe. It was 5.30 a.m., and Mr. Corn was beginning his day. Fred Gum, five thirty already. I tell you, this fast-paced life I lead. Well, goodbye, blissful slumber. Hello, Tuesday morning. <laughs> All right, Elmer. That's enough procrastinating. It's time to get out of bed and begin our day. Now, yeah, let's see what we got on the calendar here. Let's see what I'm going to have to do today. Let's see. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Oh, got to deliver 60 pounds of manure to Duluth, Montana. Well, all right. I hadn't been to Duluth in quite a while. Well, let's see. I guess I'll go outside and see if the boys delivered the paper yet. Yeah. Oh, boy, what a beautiful morning. Hello, world. Now, well, let's see here. The boy usually throws the paper by the fence. Yeah, it's still a little too dark to see. Boy, I got a bad case of sewer breath. I got to remind myself to brush my teeth when I get back inside. Oh, there's paper right over there. Yes, sirree, Bob, right by the fence, just like every day. Well, now, let's see what the good news is. Yeah. Biloxi, baffled and bewildered. The population of Biloxi continues to dwindle, say police, who have been investigating the disappearances of three citizens since yesterday morning. Police Chief Lester Corn says he is unable to link the disappearances with the dozens of UFO sightings that have been reported over the past 24 hours. Oh, come on now. Dang it. It's a sad state of affairs when the Biloxi Gazette resorts to this sort of sensationalism, like the National Enquirer. Well, I can't read no more of this garbage on an empty stomach. I, I got just enough time to go inside and fix me a bologna sandwich. Oh, oh. oh my good Lord, they got lots of me. No. No, wait a minute. I'm still standing. Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, I, I, I think maybe it was a meteor. It, it fell right over here. At... No. No, wait a minute. That ain't no meteor. That there's a real live flying saucer. Yes. Yes, you heard correctly. A flying saucer. Mr. Corn, being the inquisitive man that he is, picked up a stick and poked the side of the vessel several times. Suddenly, a hatch opened, causing Mr. Corn to recoil in fear. Whoa! He peered into the saucer, expecting something or someone to exit. But Hello? nothing did. Hello. The suspense was more than even Mr. Corn could withstand. Reluctantly, 
he entered the saucer. Hey, hello? Hey, yeah. Boy, there's lights and all kinds of stuff going on in this thing. She thought. Hey, there's a, there's a little blue fella right over there by that... Uh-oh. Oh, he's in bad shape. Whoa! Flea bar to our deck four. Flea bar to our deck four. All scout ships are ordered to return to the planet Tontanium at once. The TV Repeat, screen. return at once. Confirm transmission. Oh, oh boy, you scared the bejeebies out of me. Uh, what was that, sir? I, I didn't quite understand you the first time. Earth creature, state your intrusion on the Tontanium scout ship. What is your identity code? Uh, identity code? Oh, you mean my name. Uh, it's Elmer Corn, sir. Biloxi Manure Hauler. Uh, I, I guess you're calling this little blue feller here. I'm, uh, I'm afraid to tell you I don't think he's gonna be coming home anytime soon. Uh, he got the top of his head cut right off. He just, uh, fell on this, uh, piece of jagged metal here. Uh, if it's any consolation, though, I don't think he suffered any. Ah, uh, distressful as this. Many times have I told him that Earth's satellite transmissions can drain power cells. Perhaps he never get it too close to our power source. Oh, well, I, I guess that's possible. Biloxi TV's just up the road here. Uh, I think he ran into a telephone pole, though. Earthling, what is the condition of the vessel? Uh, what's that? Uh, oh, you mean the ship. Uh, well, it's got a big old den outside, and, uh, I'd say that's about all that's wrong with it. Your machinery and everything's working inside, and... Uh, like I said, your friend here met a pretty bitter end, but uh, other than that, I guess everything's all right. Uh, say, you, you ever heard of seat belts? That, that might have saved your friend. Our deck can be saved, Earthling. Oh, yeah? You must navigate the vessel to the planet Titanium at once. Oh, no, I don't, sir. Now, you now... must engage power cells and navigate the ship at once. What? Time is limited. We must examine Ardak's body immediately. Now, sir, everybody's got to go sometime. Now, I'm awful sorry that your friend here has passed on, but I I, I can't do nothing for you. And, and I've got places to go. Besides, you can't do nothing for this fella. The top of his head's cut off. Perhaps on your intellectually backward planet, a dismembered cranium is fatal. However, on our planet, our medical technology far exceeds the knowledge of even your finest surgeons. However... As we speak, Ardax tissues deteriorate, and time is running out. So, will you navigate the ship, human? <sighs> yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll navigate the ship. I, I just can't say no to someone who's in need, and if you think you can save him, I'll, I'll bring the ship to your planet. You'll just have to tell me how to work it. But there's a feller in Duluth, Montana, who ain't gonna be too happy when his load of cow flop don't show up. The alien on the ship's telescreen instructed Elmer how to navigate the saucer. He traveled billions of light years and passed through a million galaxies in a matter of seconds. According to Elmer's watch, the entire trip to the planet Tontanium took 30 minutes. Attention, human. Engage landing gear. Huh? Engage landing gear. What's that? Engage standing gear now, Demon. Oh, okay. Careful. All right. Careful, Demon. Whoa. Careful. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Careful, whoa. Woo! Woo! Oh, land of that stuff. Very good, Demon. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Go. You'll be greeted at the main gate. You may now exit the vessel. That door opened up by itself. I guess I'm supposed to walk down this landed walkway here. Oh, look at those little blue feathers down there. They must be my welcoming committee. Uh, howdy, fellas. Greetings. Uh, say, did you see me land that spaceship? I'd land her just like old Buck Rogers, and I'd never been behind the wheel of one in my life. Affirmative. It was most impressive, human. We extend our gratitude to you for returning the body of Ardak to us. Premat, Zybon, take the body of Ardak to the refrigeration chambers. He is still sufficiently fresh. Well, uh, you ain't gonna chill him, are you? I thought she's gonna operate on him. In due time, human. We hope you find your stay on the planet Tontanium a pleasant one. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. I'm afraid I can't stay another second. I gotta rush home and get that load of cow dung on the road. But I do appreciate the offer, though. Premat, Affirmative Bon. Affirmative him. Hey! Come with us. Take the human to the holding chamber. Hey, let me go. Come with us. Come with us. Come with us, human. Hey, where'd you this take... Way. Hey! He is a very fine specimen. Specimen? Hey, what do you mean, specimen? Hey, where you taking me? Hey, I don't want it. Hey! Hey, the... Yes. He is a very fine specimen indeed. Farewell, Earthling. 
Well, now, I suppose you're wondering what the aliens plan to do with our hero. Well, you can only imagine Elmer's confusion as he was escorted by force to a large metal cage. This way, human. This way. This way. Take it easy now. Silence. Hey, now let me go. Ah. You're too rough with me now. What are you going to do? Get into the holding cell. Hey, it. Now, silence. This is an awful way to show gratitude. That's all I got to say. I've traveled billions of miles to bring that body to your planet, and you just threw me in a cave. Well, dang you. Dang you all the heck. Elmer, is that you? What? Cecil Ferris? Yeah, it's Cecil Ferris. Well, I've been dead good. Well, what are you doing here, Cecil? Well, I got abducted by one of them there UFOs, and here I am with everybody else. Well, heck, I recognize all of y'all. That There's Miss Maddox over there. Hello, Howdy, Miss Maddox. Hello, yeah. son. There's Mr. Craig. Yeah, Howdy, Mr. Craig. Elmer. Well, what are you all doing here? Well, Elmer, them there aliens threw us in this cage, and we're sitting here to wait. That's right. I read about three people disappearing this morning in the Biloxi Gazette. I thought it was a load of crock, but I guess it's true. It's true. Yeah, it's true, it's true, true. Elmer. Well, it's hell, true. at least you guys were abducted. I'm here because I drove here. I thought I was helping these aliens out, but I guess I'm the big fool. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what do you figure they're planning to do with us? Elmer, I kind of hesitate to tell you. Attention, humans. It is time to take another subject. Oh, my God. You. No. Come with us. No, not me. It is time. No. No. Come now. No, you let me go. Come now, humans. You human. let me go. No. Come with us, humans. No. Come with us. No. Do not struggle. I don't want to go. Do not struggle, humans. No, we're saving. Go with me, humans. We're saving. Save me. Save me. Save me. Dad, gone. Boy, he really kicked up the dust. He sure did, Elmer. He sure say, did. say, what are they going to do to him? Are they going to torture him? No. Uh-uh. No. Are they going to run experiments on him? No. No, son, no, not, no. Elmer, no. Well, they ain't going to. They ain't going to eat him, are they? Bang, Bang yo, Elmer, Elmer, you, you got, got it. Dad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, boy, this kind of <laughs> puts a damper on things. Yeah, I've been kind of depressed here lately. <laughs> uh, now, 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 Miss Maddox, Miss Maddox, you hush up that baller. The worst thing you can do at a moment like this is to punch. Now, you just hush up all that balling. Oh, Elmer's here, and he's going to do something about this mess. I certainly... At least, uh, at least I think I am. I certainly hope so, Elmer. When that alien gets back here, you let me do all the talking, all right? Uh, okay, all right, Elmer. Now, between, all right. between then and now... Why don't we uh, sing us a little song? Oh, no. Help cheer us up. (laughs) You all know this one. Sing along with Elmer. Okay, Elmer. If you're happy and you know it, say I am. I am. If you're happy and you know it, say I am. I am. If you're happy and you know it, then you like what you're truly happy. Mr. Corn tried the best he could to raise the spirits of his fellow prisoners. Uh, however, uh, knowing you're about to become the main course on an alien's menu tends to put one in a dampened disposition. <sighs> then, the, then the fella behind the bar said, That ain't no dog, mister. That there's my wife. Oh, <laughs> oh, Elmer, Elmer, Elmer. That's my wife is what Elmer. he said. Elmer, Elmer, that was the worst joke I have ever heard in my life. Yeah, oh, I'll now come on, Elmer. Cecil. It's the situation we're in. Uh, now, if we was anywhere besides in this old cage, I, I swear you'd be laughing to your ribs, crying. I don't know about that. You too, Mrs. Maddie. I don't think so, uh, Elmer. Oh, I don't think so. Now, now like, uh, oh, no. now, wait a minute. Oh, now, listen no. to what, you remember what oh, I said. No. Let me do the talking. Attention, humans. It is time to take another subject. We will take the elderly female human. Oh, no. Come with us now. No, no, wait a minute. Don't take me. Save me, Elmer. Save me, uh, Elmer. Yes, yes, sir, Miss Maddox. Uh, 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 listen, uh, sir, uh, if you don't mind, I'd rather go in her place. Affirmative. Uh, I, I just can't stand all this waiting. It's just eating my guts out. I'd rather just get it over with and be done with it. Affirmative. One human is just as sufficient as another. Come with us. Well, thank you kindly, sir. Much obliged. Well, that's okay. You don't have to drag me. I'll go on my own accord. Silence. 
You sure got a nice place here. Beautiful place. Silence. We gonna go in that room right there? I thought I said, well, all right. I'm ready to be eaten. Silence. Playback. Here's the next subject. Ah, I see you have brought our latest visitor to me. A greeting, safely. Yeah, yeah, aloha. Hey, listen, feller, just what is the deal around here? What what, what are you fellers up to? Are we your idea of fancy takeout or something? Ow! Silence! Uh, there is no need to strike the human. His sarcasm is understandable. Uh, uh, human, I suppose you wonder why we consume Earth creatures. Well, yes, sir, I gotta admit I am a bit curious. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, human... For billions of eons, we have sustained our race on mineral deposits mined from our planet's core. However, recently our food supply has been completely exhausted. No alternative food source has been discovered. Tontaniites die by the thousands. We consume their corpses for nutritional value, but that is insufficient. Good Earth Lord. is the only life-sustaining planet we have discovered. Humans are plentiful, and they are nutritionally high in value. We regret that you must die. So that we may live. Well, I tell you, I'm not doing a big backflip with joy about it myself. Liban, Cremat, sustain the human. Earth creature, Liban will now use a Centratron unit to inject a paralyzing electronic charge into your body. What? Your body will then be dismembered and sectioned into nutrition pellets. Oh, no. We assure you, you will feel no pain. Well, I wish I could say the same for you. Give me that Centratron unit. Eh? Return the Citratron unit. Return the Citratron unit to me. Uh, Return it. Return that, it immediately. That's a big neck of toy, Blue Man, but I am going to give you a dose of it. Negative. <laughs> that ought to hold you two for a while. And as for you, Doc, you better open up that door. I'm going to zap you too. Uh, this is foolish, human. You cannot possibly escape. I wouldn't count on it. I'm pretty dead gum agile. Now open the door. Uh, very well. Elma raced down the hall to the Tontanium Embassy. Armed guards fired laser shots at him on all sides, but they could not keep up. Soon, Mr. Corn was at the holding cell that contained his friend. Elma, come on! Save us now! Over here, Elma! Elma, Elma, over here! Hey, is everybody all right? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Well, look, we're going to have to get the hell out of here. Them yeah, guards are going to be catching up with me any second now. All right. You ready to run like your butt's on fire? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is control panel here that operates the door. Let's, let's just hope I get it. Oh, well, look at there. I got it. First off. Come on, everybody. Come on, run. 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 I know where the ships are at. I know where the saucers are kept. Come on, everybody. The prisoners followed Elma, feeling confident that he would lead them to safety. He herded them into one of the saucers, and then, to ensure they would not be followed, he smashed the controls of the remaining ships. By the time the aliens caught up with them, it was too late. All right. Elma was zooming at warp speed towards Earth and safety. road again. We're on the road again. Say, how's everybody doing? I'm doing just fine, Albert. I sure can't wait to get back to Biloxi. Well, it won't be too long. I'll bet we're just about ten minutes from her. <laughs> oh, what's wrong, Miss Maddox? I feel like I'm going to vomit, Albert. Thank oh. you, Albert. Well, it's that warp sickness, Miss Maddox. Uh, just put your head between your legs, honey. That's what does it. Yes, Traveling out Elmer, the speed of light will do it every time. Yes, honey, I know. I feel... Uh-oh. Now, there goes that telescreen. Attention, human. Uh-huh. Before you, return the subject to our planet at once. Uh, you guys must be touching the head or something. Listen, where I come from, fellers don't eat other fellers. It just ain't done. It's immoral and illegal, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're just going to be disappointed. I'm taking these people right home, and they're going to be safe and sound. Sorry. Uh, Human, you are wise to take the subjects with you. 
we allowed our food supply to diminish. The fault is our own. Soon we will die. Soon our planet will be a barren horn floating in space. We are sorry. We are so sorry. Now, now, I ain't gonna sit here and listen to that sort of foolish talk. You sound gloomier than a hawk without mud. There's an answer to everything. If you people can just stand without eating for one more day, I'll come back with a solution to your problem. And I Elmer, promise. Elmer, what are you gonna do? Uh, now you just hold your horses, Cecil. You'll see. After returning to Earth, Mr. Korn gathered the materials needed to solve the alien's dilemma. Soon he was back on the planet Tontinium, and he was not alone. Well, here you are. A uh, human. I do not wish to sound lacking in appreciation, but uh -huh. what are these strange creatures? Oh, uh, well, over there's a cow, you see. He's your beef. And over there next to it is a bull. And you got your chicken for eggs. And you got your hogs for your bacon products and your ham and all that. The point is, all this stuff is good to eat. You know how to fix it, right? Remarkable. Pre-match. Affirmative. What is the nutritional analysis of the horned creature? It is sufficiently high in protein, iron, and essential vitamins. That's right, and it's good for you, too. You pull them things underneath that cow, and you'll get milk, and that's real good. That gives you your calcium. And if you put that there horned creature, as you call it, with that cow, it'll make more cows than horned creatures. Reproduction, a primitive earth concept. We use a genetic duplicator. <laughs> well, I guess that works, too, but I think always a heck of a lot more fun. Well, anyway, all this stuff is real good for you. I also brought you some vegetables, and then I brought you some recipes to help you fix all this stuff up. Remarkable. We can reproduce all of these food products with a duplicon. Human, you have saved our planet from inevitable doom. We extend our sincere gratitude, and we humbly apologize for the human that we have consumed. We have violated natural law. Oh, well, that's okay. That was the town drunk that you ate, and I don't think we're going to be missing him too much down there on Earth. As far as thinking me, sir, you don't have to bother. My mama, sweet old woman, said as long as I got food, ain't nobody in need going to go hungry, and I've, I've kind of followed that path. I'm just glad that you people are going to be all right. I have one question, human. Okay. Does not the consumption of the creatures violate natural laws? Uh, eh. Why did you strike me upon the cranium? Silence, foolish one. The human is saving our lives. I tell you, fellas, I, I sure would like to stay around and chew the fat with y'all, but I just can't stay another second. I'm already two days late on that Duluth, Montana manure haul. But I tell you what, I want you guys to not be such a stranger. Y'all stop by on Earth every now and then and visit me, you hear? Affirmative. You are a friend to us also, human. And a savior. And please... Feel free to take one of our transport vehicles with our gratitude. Well, well, thank you kindly, sir. I appreciate that. I'll do that. I'll see y'all people later. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's time to hit the old warp drive here. Hey, if you're happy and you know it, say I am. I am. If you're happy and you know it, say I am. I am. Here we go. Mr. Cole once again sped towards Mother Earth, singing a happy tune. His soul was filled with heartfelt pride, for an entire planet considered him the Savior. There now, <laughs> that was a painless story, wasn't it? Yes. I must admit, all this talk of food has made me hungry. <laughs> I, I suppose if I had the, the appetite of one of those aliens, I would have a regular smorgasbord here in the morgue. <laughs> oh, forgive me. That was disgusting. Oh, oh please don't leave. I, I hope I haven't offended you. I was merely joking. Well, if you must go, you will return, won't you? It gets so lonely here in the morgue, and I have many stories to tell. Until then, pleasant dreams.
have just heard, Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Moor. Today's installment, Elmer vs. the Invaders. For correspondence, send to M&J Audio Theater, P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities to actual persons, including aliens, is purely coincidental. A production by M and J Audio Theater. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Many creatures have called the swamp their home. Whether it be lizards, big hairy men, or sea monsters, the swamp is a biome surrounded by legend and fear. The beasts that inhabit are known to be twisted and terrifying with horrid appearances and even more terrible tales. So I'm sure when you hear the name Big Muddy Monster, you get the chills, right? A sinking feeling in your stomach or a shiver out of terror? Yeah, I didn't think so. Any legend with the name of something out of Sesame Street doesn't have much of a reputation for scaring people. Despite this, the legend of the Big Muddy Monster is pervasive throughout southern Illinois, and its significance is undeniable. It all began in 1973, and the story is probably best told by an article printed in the New York Times of that year entitled, Yeti-like Monster Gives Stayed Town in Illinois a Fright. Here is that newspaper article, printed so appropriately on Halloween 1973. Murfreesboro, Illinois, October 31. Mrs. Nedra Green was preparing for bed in her isolated farmhouse near here the other night when a shrill, piercing scream came from out by the shed. It's it again, she said. Four-year-old Christian was in his backyard chasing fireflies with a glass jar. He ran in the house. Daddy, Daddy, he said, there's a big ghost out back. Randy Creeth and Cheryl Ray were talking on her darkened porch when something moved in the brush nearby. Cheryl went to turn on a light. Randy went to investigate. At that moment, it stepped from the bushes. Towering over the wide-eyed teenage couple was a creature resembling a gorilla. It was eight feet tall. It had long, shaggy, matted hair colored a dirty white smelled foul like river slime. Silently, the couple stared at the creature, and the creature stared at the couple, fifteen feet apart. Then, after an eternity of perhaps thirty seconds, the creature turned slowly and crashed off through the brush back towards the river. It was the Murfreesboro Monster, a strange creature that has baffled and frightened the police and residents for weeks now in this southern Illinois town on the sluggish Big Muddy River. It is a creature that has brought a real kind of Halloween to Murfreesboro's 10,000 citizens. And although the Hobgoblin is so far benevolent, no one here is taking any chances. Many have armed themselves, and a good number of God-fearing families decided to curtail traditional Halloween trick-or-treating rounds. Such monster sightings are bizarre indeed for an old farm county seat where brightly colored leaves fall on brick streets 
and high school majorettes practice baton twirling for the Red Devils' upcoming football game with Jonesboro's Wildcats. A lot of things in life are unexplained, said Toby Berger, the police chief, and this is another one. We don't know what the creature is, but we do believe what these people saw was real. We have tracked it, and the dogs got a definite scent. It all began shortly before midnight June 25th. Randy Needham and Judy Johnson were conferring in a parked car on the town's boat ramp down by the Big Muddy. At one point, the couple heard a loud cry from the woods next to the car. Many were to describe the sound as that of a greatly amplified eagle shriek. Mr. Needham looked out from the front seat. There, lumbering toward the open window, was a light-colored, hairy, eight-foot creature matted with mud. At that point, the police report calmly notes, complainant left the area. He proceeded to the station and filed an unknown creature report. Judy Johnson was married at the time, according to the police, but not to Mr. Needham, so when the two reported the monster, the authorities took it seriously. They wouldn't risk all that if they weren't really scared, said one. Later, as Officer Jimmy Nash inspected some peculiar footprints fast disappearing in the oozing mud left by the receding river, he became a firm believer. I was leaning over when there was the most incredible shriek I've ever heard, he said. It was in those bushes. That was no bobcat or a screech owl, and we hightailed it out of there. Officers searched the riverbank for hours, following an elusive splashing sound like something floundering through knee-deep water. They found nothing. Plains folk hereabouts do not excite easily, so the next day, on page three, the Southern Illinoisan published a 200-word account of the critter, omitting the embarrassed couple's names. That presumably was the end of the case. But the next night came young Christian Beryl's encounter and the experience of Cheryl Ray and Randy Kreef, the 17-year-old son of a state trooper who drew a picture of the creature. That did it for Chief Berger. He ordered his entire 14-man force out for a night-long search, and Jerry Nellis, a dog trainer, brought Reb, an 80-pound German shepherd renowned for his zealous tracking. With floodlights, officers discovered a rough trail in the brush. Grass was crushed, broken branches dangled, small trees were snapped. On the grass, Reb found gobs of black slime, much like that of sewage sludge in settling tanks on a direct line between the river and the Ray House. Reb led Mr. Nellis and Officer Nash to an abandoned barn on the old Buller farm. Then, at the door, the dog yelped and backed off in panic. Mr. Nellis threw it into the doorway. The dog crawled out, whining. The man radioed for help. Fourteen area police cars responded, but the barn, it turned out, was empty. Ten days later, the Miller Carnival was set up in the town's Riverside Park, not far from the boat ramp. At 2 a.m., July 7th, the day's festivities had stopped and the ponies that walk around in circles with youngsters on their backs were tied to bushes. Suddenly, they shied. They rolled their eyes, they raised their heads, they tried to pull free. Attracted by the commotion, three carnival workers, Otis Norris, Ray Adgerson, and Wesley Lavender, walked around the truck, and there, standing upright in the darkness, was a 300- to 400-pound creature, hairy and light-colored and about eight feet tall. With no menace but intent curiosity, the creature was watching the animals. The men ran for help. The creature left. But an hour later, Charles Kimball saw it again, peering over the bushes, its head cocked watching the ponies. The creature report, which carnival operators delayed filing to avoid hurting business, was the last official note of the Murfreesboro monster. However, there have been many incidents that have not been reported for fear, not of the monster but of the hundreds of humans who flock to each sighting with rifles and shotguns. Somehow, no one has shot anyone else, yet, but the police had to close the park one night. It was crammed full of hunters and curious campers. This is no hoax, said Tony Stevens, the newspaper editor. This is hunting country, you know, and anyone who goes around in an animal costume is going to get his butt shot off. Local officials are not really sure what to do. They invited Harlan Sorkin, a St. Louis expert on such creatures, down for a spell. Mr. Sorkin said the descriptions match those of over 300 similar sightings in North America in the last decade, one of them on an Ohio River levee not far from here. There's even been a movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, 
made about a similar creature in Arkansas. Mr. Sorkin says the creature is probably a Sasquatch, believed to be a gene deviation in a large ape that has produced a creature that Tibetans call the Abominable Snowman or Yeti and Rocky Mountain Indians call Bigfoot. Typically, he said, these creatures are very shy and favor river bottoms for their ample vegetation. Even in winter here in southern Illinois, which is farther south than almost all of Virginia, plenty of plant life is available, especially in the vast Shawnee National Forest that straddles the state 400 miles south of Chicago. Mr. Sorkin speculates that this year's flooding forced the creature from its natural home, perhaps a cave downriver. Generally placid creatures, the Sasquatch is said to have killed some hunting dogs during chases, and there are stories of wilderness loggers in the Northwest found crushed next to their emptied rifles. These creatures have the strength of five men, Mr. Sorkin said, and when frightened, they take five-foot strides. To skeptics, Mr. Sorkin replies, you know the gorillas, as we know it today, were not discovered until the early 1800s. Can you imagine what people thought when they first saw it? Whatever it's called, the exotic new inhabitant here is real to residents of Murfreesboro, a hospitable town which the Chamber of Commerce says welcomes newcomers in a way that makes them happy to be living here. These are good, honest people, said Chief Berger. They're seeing something. And who would walk through sewage tanks for a joke? I know it's out there, said young Randy Creeth. It'd be fascinating to see it again and study it, but, you know, I kind of hope he doesn't come back. With everyone running around with guns and sticks, he really wouldn't have much of a chance, would he? It's been a long time since that article was written and printed in 1973, but the Big Muddy Monster is still a key part of the culture in Murfreesboro, Illinois today. Despite the lack of recent sightings, people still come from all over the marshland near Murfreesboro in an attempt to receive glory for capturing the beast. Illinois is filled with game hunters and other rifle-owning townspeople ready to take a shot at whatever is plaguing the locals. No shots have been fired as of now, but the police have had to close off the area on multiple occasions due to the sheer amount of people crowded around. So what is this massive, mud-loving creature? Well, the conclusion of most townspeople and cryptozoologists is similar to what was concluded in the 1973 newspaper article. The animal is most likely a Sasquatch. The shy yet powerful creatures have been hunted for decades, with countless spin-off creatures taking after their legacy, and this big, muddy monster might yet be one of them. If you wish to visit Murfreesboro, Illinois, try not to go while covered in mud, as some locals might be ready to file a police report on their odd encounter with you, and possibly take a shot hoping to gain muddy monster glory. When Weird Darkness Returns In 1947, a woman jumped to her death from the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. Yet today, her ghost still needs to use the building's bathroom facilities. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
You're about to hear a new NBC presentation, Cloak and Dagger, program number one in 90 minutes of continuous mystery and suspense on NBC. Following Cloak and Dagger, stay tuned for High Adventure, then listen to The Big Guy, NBC's new unique mystery series. But first, Cloak and Dagger. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission for the United States? knowing in advance you may never return alive? What you have just heard is a question asked during the war of agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. We have the honor at this time to present a former OSS officer, co-author of the book Cloak and Dagger, upon which this series is based, Colonel Corey Ford. Thank you. OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, was America's top secret intelligence agency during the war. It was this country's first all-out effort in black warfare, dropping undercover operators behind enemy lines, organizing local partisans to blow bridges and dynamite tunnels, outwitting the best spy systems of Europe and Asia. The success of OSS is known. But the story behind that success, the story of the everyday, average Americans of every race and creed and color who risked their lives knowing all too well that if they were caught, they would face torture and probably death, is what Alastair McBain and I have tried to tell in Cloak and Dagger. We feel it is a story in which every American can take deep pride. The National Broadcasting Company takes you behind the scenes of a war that nobody knew. This is Cloak and Dagger. My name is Friedrich Schmidt. I'm a German soldier. I had a medical discharge from the Army. I was in the 268th Infantry Division. My family was killed in an air raid near Berlin. My name is Friedrich Schmidt. I'm a German soldier. I'll repeat it over and over again so I won't forget... My name is Friedrich Schmidt. Ah, where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? I think back and remember. From the beginning. Everything the colonel told me to remember. Remember, Frank. From now on, you'll be Friedrich Schmidt, German soldier. You have your military pass, forged signatures of adjutants, hospital certificates, ration coupons, permits to travel. You know what to do. Yes, Colonel. Carl and I parachute behind the enemy lines in Austria. We radio back information on the strength and location of German troops around Innsbruck. You realize there'll be no help from headquarters? No contact waiting for you below? Well, sir, Carl knows the country and his sister is still living there. I uh, needn't tell you the risk you're taking. Of course, you'll land in American uniform, so in case you're picked up immediately, you'll be treated as prisoners of war. However, later, if you're caught out of uniform in enemy country, uh... I think I know what to expect, sir. All right, then. Just one more thing. The information we're after is vital. The Third Army is closing in fast, and we must know what's ahead for them. I'll expect your first message in ten days. You'll have it, sir. Oh, and, uh, by the way, Colonel. Yes? Don't forget to have that package mailed to Rhode Island for me next month. It's my father's birthday. Cigarette, Frank? Uh, thanks, Carl. Carl, I, uh... Yes, what is it? About Liesel. About your sister. Oh, what about her? You haven't seen her for over five years. <laughs> over six years. Well, uh, six years is a long time. Running in. Hey, that's oh. us. Get ready to jump. Uh, what did you uh, want to ask about Liesel? Oh, nothing. Forget it. Ready, number one. Ready? Jump. I'll see you downstairs. Ready, number two. Ready. Good luck, Frank. Go! I heard the crack of the parachute as it snapped open. I looked down, 
I saw a patch of snow in the valley, spreading wider and wider in the moonlight, like a blot of milk spilled on a kitchen table. And I thought of Carl's sister, and the question I didn't have the courage to ask him. You all right, Frank? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, well, we made it. The first step. Yeah. You got everything? The radio all right? Just checked it. Nothing broke. Good. Uh, there goes the plane. Yeah. Heading back. He's gone. Let's go while it's dark. Sun's starting to come up. Yeah, keep that cape around you. There'll be people on this road soon. What do you think about that sun? What about it? Astronomers must be nuts. That can't be the same sun I used to see back in Providence. <laughs> Maybe it isn't. Schlaf nun ein, schlaf nun ein, die Nacht ist da der Morgen Hey, what is that? You've been singing that for hours. What is that, a kid's lullaby? Eh? I made it up. Oh? Made it up for Liesel when she was a little girl. I used to sing her to sleep with it. Oh. Frank? Yeah? On the plane, before we jumped, there was something you wanted to ask me about her. What was it? Listen, eh? here comes a cart. Watch your cape. Don't let the wind blow it. Yeah. Heil Hitler. Good morgen, Fräulein. Heil Hitler. How many kilometers until the railroad station? About two kilometers. Dale and Doc. Doc is schön. Good, only two more. Uh, this rucksack weighs a ton. Hope there's no standing room on that train. I hope there aren't too many German officers. Come on. You know, one thing I like about European trains... What? These little compartments. I'd just as soon be closed off in here until we get where we're going. We've got to get rid of these American uniforms, Frank, as soon as possible. Well, we'll just have to find two obliging German soldiers who'll be willing to give up theirs. <laughs> that obliging they are not. Well, so far they've been. Let us have a nice compartment all to ourselves. Well, there's no guarantee they'll let us keep it that way, you know. <laughs> I know one of these yes, things here. Yes, oh. Yes. Get out your tribal permit and identification now. Right. Hope those papers are good forgeries. They better be. Gentlemen, your identification, travel permit, if please. Uh, yeah, Your Inspector, yeah. Uh, huh? Now yours, if you please, Herr Leutnant. Here you are. Yeah. Here are your papers, Herr Lieutenant. These seem to be in order. Danke schön. How much longer till we get there? About uh, 30 minutes. You think he was suspicious? Well, he didn't act it. Just the same if anyone else comes. If you have to take off your cape, take it off in one motion. Your jacket with it. We might get away with a khaki shirt. Our luck's held out so far. Maybe nobody will come. Let's hope so. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Here comes company. Here comes trouble. Uh, may I show you compartment, gentlemen? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, Herr Hauptmann. Uh, yeah, it's stuffy in here. Why don't you remove your capes? Well, uh, it was so cold in the snow country. We're both of us just back from there. Uh, it will take us time to thaw out. Uh. <laughs> uh, join me in some snaps, gentlemen. Ah, danke, danke. And you? Danke schön. Uh, these trains, either too stuffy or too drafty. They're all badly on down since the war. Uh, you warmer now? Oh, much. Then remove your capes. Uh, I perspire looking at you. <laughs> well, uh... Go on, take them off. The Hauptmann is right. It is hot. Better. Ah, much better. Ah, are you going to Salzburg? Uh, no. Insing. Uh, sure. 
You must forgive me. Perhaps it's the heat. Uh, perhaps too much of this bottle. But I'm going to stretch out in the empty compartment next door. I'd appreciate it if you gentlemen uh, would wake me when we get off at your station. Well, I will be happy to. Uh... Well, then I'll see you again. You'll see me again and soon, Frank. Wait here with the radio. What are you going to do? Our friend was warm. I'll help him out by relieving him of his uniform. No, Carl. No. You'll, you'll find his body before we get to Insane. Insane. They'll find it on the roadbed two days from now. No, Carl. You can't take that risk. One of us in German uniform would help. Wait here. Kindly raise your hands. I was not so drunk as either of you thought. <laughs> it's too bad about your friend. An unfortunate accident. He fell from the tree. A pity. It was as if I were standing three feet behind myself, watching, watching myself knock the Luger out of his hand, watch my fingers go around his throat. He gave a few convulsive jerks, and then he was still. In his hand, he held a button he had ripped from my shirt. For some reason, I reached down and I took it from him. The next few minutes, I worked fast. The train was slowing down. I stuffed my uniform into the rucksack where the radio was and borrowed his. It wasn't a perfect fit, but German uniforms never are. And this German wouldn't be needing his anymore. I opened the door of the compartment and for the second time that day, jumped to German soil. <coughs> Think slowly now. Somewhere from that moment on, I made the mistake. Where did I go wrong? Where did I make that mistake? You've made a mistake, Herr Leutnant. My brother is not in Austria. Please listen to me. Carl was with me. We were both coming here together before the accident on the train. You're mistaken. My brother's not in Austria. Please, I'm taking a chance coming here at all. I only have Carl's word that you'll help me. My brother is not in Austria. Look, I'm tired. I'm hungry. Liesel, poor Carl. There's not much to eat. Some bread and some soup. Sit down. I'll bring it to you. <laughs> I watched Carl's sister as she went over to the stove. She was small and dark, and her hair was cut short and brushed back. It was fine, like soft baby hair. I felt so tired, I wanted to brush my face against it. Here's your soup. Danke schön. There's more in the pot if you want it. I'll be back. Where are you going? There's someone you might like to meet. A contact. I'll get him. Stay here and eat. I'll be right back. I see you've finished the soup. Yeah. I hope it isn't all you have. Oh, no, no, no. It's all right. Where's your friend? Friend? Oh, uh, you mean, uh, well, he's coming. He's... Coming soon. Good. Carl said you'd be in touch with the Austrian partisans. I need help, Liesel. I need all the help I can get. My friend should be here any minute. I think I'll wash the dishes now. Since everything around us is in such disorder, I... I like to keep some order about myself. Here, I'll wipe. Do you mind? If you like. Um, dee -dee. <laughs> Why does this seem so funny? What? What's happened to the world when you start taking the crazy things for granted and the ordinary things seem out of tune with the rest of living? Like watching a woman doing the dishes, helping her. You don't seem tired anymore. No, oh, I feel fine now. Fine. Shalom. How did you know that song? Carl. Carl was singing it. Oh, oh my God. Oh. Liesl, what is it? 
You were pale as a ghost. I didn't know. Oh, Lord, I didn't know. You didn't know what? What are you talking about? The Gestapo is coming. I told them you were here. What did you say? The Commandant, Gubner, he suspected me for a long time, but he's had no proof. I thought he he had sent you to, to trick me. I was afraid. Are you telling me the truth? Yes. Are you telling me the truth now? I swear I'll it. shake it out of you. Oh, you you've got to trust me. You have no one else to turn to now. You've got to trust me. Oh, you've got to trust me. I should kill you. I ought to kill you. Now, listen to me. You can get out of the back door now if you want. Oh, but don't know you won't get far there. Oh, you better go down there to the cellar and trust me. Open up in there. I have no choice. Quick, quick, quick. That door. It leads to the cellar. Go quickly. Open up. In a minute. Well, where is he? Gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Well, I... I try to keep him here. I I couldn't without arousing his suspicion. Yeah. So I, uh... Yeah? Well, you asked me not to do that, remember? Yeah, go on. Well, he was only passing through. He said he... He had a friend in the mountains. In a hut in the mountains... He told me where it was. You'll take us then, now. Of course. Sergeant. Just follow me. Round up the men. Yeah, here, come along. After you, Liesel. <laughs> I needn't tell you you're doing a great service for the fatherland. Take your hands off me. I've given enough proof of my loyalty. Yes. Any word from Frank or Carl yet? No, Colonel, nothing. Oh, something hit a snag. It's been 12 days since they jumped. Well, let me know. Wait a minute. Something Here's something now. now. 2345. Brooklyn calling. Brook. All well. That's it. Brooklyn. This is That's Brooklyn. the code name. Hey, he's coming through the clear. Time is now 2345. Huh? Come in. Over. Dodger to Brooklyn. We hear you. Over. Average 14 inches snowfall nightly. Take this down. Yes. Average 14 trains a night being assembled. Carrying sugar to Dixie. Carrying supplies to southern German All France. snow jamming Grand Canyon. All trains routed by Borelberg Tunnel. Juniors gaining weight. Over. Wehrmacht gathering strength. Uh, Corporal, let me at that radio. Dodger to Brooklyn. Making this fast. Sending it in clear. Imperative, learn within two weeks disposition of all airborne troops and units within your area. Good night. Good luck. Over. Well, Carl, keep the home fires burning. Good night. Over and out. Well, that's the first one, Liesel. They got it. I haven't got much time. You heard them just two weeks. Oh, don't worry. We'll have the information. Uh, how nice it must be to be Liesel. So confident, so cool and sure. But I'm not. I'm afraid. I don't sleep at night. I'm afraid all the time. Oh, Freddy. Freddy. Please, oh. From the night I first came there and crawled into the corner of that damp cellar while she led the Gestapo on a merry chase through the mountains, Liesel and I worked hard. My radio aerial was set up, hidden, lost in a mass of closed lines. Together we rounded up Austrian partisans. Where did I go wrong? So you are Liesel's cousin, Freddy. Yeah, Herr Commandant. I am Liesel's cousin. Would you, uh, would you like some wine, Commandant? Danke schön. I didn't know Liesel had a cousin from Berlin. We knew she had a brother, Karl... Well, Liesel and I never mentioned Karl, Herr Commandant. We're loyal Nazis. Ah, yes. Prost? Prost. I suppose she told you what happened to her a few days before you came. Some, some more wine, Commandant. Ah, I haven't finished this glass yet, Liesel. You seem nervous. It's uh, such an honor having you visit us here. 
Ah, uh, Liesel. You know, Herr Leutnant, your little cousin has been much nicer to me lately. I tried to convince her for some time that there are advantages to being friendly with the right people. I suppose she told you about the American spy who came here over a week ago. I find that hard to believe. I'm not sure what he was. He was in German uniform, and he may have been a deserter. Mm. Possibly. In any case, we had a long search for nothing that night. We found no trace of him. You say you have a medical discharge, Herr Leutnant? Yeah, Herr Commandant. Hmm? The rest of my family was bombed out in Berlin. Oh, yes. I had no place to go, no one else to come to. So I came here. Hmm. Uh, strictly a matter of regulations. May I see your papers? Your papers, Herr Leutnant? I have them here. Here you are. Yes. <laughs> you know, Herr Leutnant, this is the first time I've seen one of these filled out correctly. Thank you for the wine, Lisa. With your permission, I'll come back again. <laughs> What's the matter, Colonel? They must be closing in on him. Home team will travel. That means he's got to move the radio. I'm going with you, Freddy. No, 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 you're not, Liesel. You're going to stay here. If we both leave when I move the radio, Gubner's sure to be suspicious. But, Freddy... You go to Fritz Heimer. Tell him to send a courier to the other town. Tell him I'll be there tomorrow night. All right. Anything you say. Here. Let me sew on that button for you. No, no, it's all right. I'll do it. Take my mind off things. You're tired. You work too hard. If the Allied Army's eyes close as you think, maybe it'll all be over soon. I'll be back. Liesel? Oh. Forgive me for just walking in, Herr Leutnant. Good evening, Herr Commandant. The door was unlatched. It's all right, Herr Commandant. I was just passing. I wanted to say hello to your little cousin and invite her to dinner at my house tomorrow night. <laughs> you think perhaps she will come this time? Perhaps, Herr Commandant. Women are never very easy to figure. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, you're right there. What are you doing? Don't let me interrupt you. Oh, just this button. It came off. Ah, so I see. <laughs> Army training is so valuable. It teaches you so many things. Even sewing on a button. I'll tell Liesel you were here. That's very obliging of you. Only I believe you will not be in a position to tell her anything. What's that? You have made just... The little slip I have been waiting for you to make. You are under arrest. Friedrich Schmidt. So many things to remember. An American cigarette could give me away an English match, laundry marks, some clothing. Cut them out, patch them up. Yes. Yes. Now I know where I made the mistake. The button... Americans sew them on in crisscross. Europeans in parallel. I was nervous and I forgot the button. And Gubner saw me. Get up. Come with me. You are wanted for more questioning. Uh, your name. Your objective. Who sent you? Where are the American armies? 
My name is Friedrich Schmidt. I'm a... Your name. The Commandant asked your name. Your objective. Your objective. Who sent you? Who sent you? Where are the American armies? My name is Friedrich Schmidt. I'm a German soldier. Oh, God, throw him back in his cell. Sleep. Try to sleep. Remember to lie when they come to take me out again for questioning. I wonder if Liesel got away. You're going on a journey, Schmidt. To another camp where they have even more persuasive ways of making you talk. I shall escort you there myself. My name is... Get up! I said get up! Driver, stop at the tavern on the right. Yeah, here, Commandant. Ah, it's a pity, Schmidt. We shall share no more wine and little cakes with Liesel. I have something else in store for Liesel when I catch up with her. Her cousin. I'll be only a few minutes, driver. You're not to speak to the prisoner while I'm gone. Do you understand? Yeah, Herr Commandant. Frank, listen. He won't catch up with Liesel because she's with friends. Carl! Liesel, you think a little fall from a train could kill me? Herr Gubner wants to know where the American armies are. He'll find out soon enough. It was your messages, Frank, that brought them where they are. Carl, I, I, I don't believe it. Listen to me, Frank. Listen, you... listen to me. Our armies walked right into that Dixie front you told them about in your messages. Right now, they're only 20 miles north. I've got 1,500 partisans organized and ready to surrender the whole town and the mayor when they get there. It's impossible. You'll see. How did you mean by listen now? At the next fork of the road, there are friends waiting to take us through to the army. The three of us. Three of us? Yes. I imagine you have a few scores to settle on the way with Herr Gubner. It wasn't coincidence, but a forged transfer that made Carl driver of that car. It wasn't luck, but carefully planned inside information that told the OSS exactly where Frank Baker was. It led to his release that closed the drawer finally on file number 2218 with the words, Mission Accomplished. And Carl's story? Carl's Adventures, also based on actual incidents, is file number 2219 in next week's Cloak and Dagger. In today's true OSS adventure, the part of Frank was played by Joseph Julian. Ross Martin was Carl, the Commandant Barry Kroger. Raymond Edward Johnson played the Colonel, Bernard Pollock the Corporal. Dolly Haas played Liesel. This has been a Lewis G. Cowan production under the supervision and direction of Sherman Marks. Material heard on today's program was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alastair McBain. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and the music was under the direction of John Gart. This is Carl Weber speaking. <laughs> Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee 
coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. A staple in the Big Apple, the Empire State Building was constructed in 1930 and 1931. A building for corporate America, it was the tallest in the world at 102 stories. The 1933 film King Kong featured the building as the giant gorilla climbed up to the top, holding the gorgeous Fay Ray as his captive. The building also attracted other young women over time. Evelyn McHale kissed her fiancé goodbye in Pennsylvania, giggling about the wedding. She gave him no indication that she wouldn't see him again. Instead, she returned to New York and proceeded to the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. She looked over the ledge, placed her coat on the parapet, and her suitcase beside her on the ground, and the 23-year-old jumped. Her body landed on a limousine. A photographer captured her lying on the crumpled roof, clutching her pearls as if she were ready for the photo. Witnesses claimed her red lipstick was untouched. People were amazed that her body was intact after such a fall. It was called a beautiful suicide by Life magazine on May 12, 1947. A suicide note was left behind. She asked for cremation so no one could see her. Evelyn said she wouldn't make a good wife for her fiancé to tell her father she was much like her mother. Evelyn's mother divorced her father without reason and suffered from a mental illness. In the over 90 years of standing, the building has witnessed 30 deaths from the observation deck of the 86th floor. In 2009, a woman committed suicide by jumping out the 39th floor window. Today, there are guards and tall fences in place that prevent more suicides. With all these deaths from the building, it may be that the trauma replays repeatedly. Perhaps some of the distressed spirits are aware of the living. Stories are told of a woman in a 1940s-style dress muttering to herself, crying with a despondent effect, then jumping off the building. These shocked individuals might later see her in the deck's women's bathroom. Perhaps she is reapplying the red lipstick she's often seen wearing. Could this be Evelyn? However, a story tells that the spirit is observed crying mourning her husband who died in the war. Others believe the spirit might be of a World War II widow who took her own life. She also places her belongings on the side and jumps. The baffled witnesses head to the bathroom where the spirit is reapplying makeup. She then tearfully drifts through the deck fences and jumps again. We know this is not Evelyn, as her fiancé survived her. There was a flurry of suicides in 1947, so it's possible another woman could be this energy. But who is the woman in the bathroom? I've not been able to find any first-hand experiences, so I might guess this is legend more than evidence-based. You never know, though, especially if you go up to play tourist and get distracted. Remember that you might be with others the next time you go up to see the views or to create the scene from Sleepless in Seattle on the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. You might need to pause in the women's restroom as you're cleaning up. Look around. Perhaps she's there, preparing for her next jump. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different, or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers, but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, 
the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes. Along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. Manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. But he isn't. Or at least I don't think he is. Perhaps we'd better find out before the curtain goes up. <laughs> the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders, and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Turpin's a fabulous ventriloquist. Oh, just listen to that applause. Yes. But he's not the best we ever had, not by a long way. Yes, I've been manager here for over 20 years, you know. I've seen them come and go. <laughs> but the best ventriloquist, the greatest act I ever saw in my life, that was Bertini. 
She was an Italian and spoke broken English, but oh, what an act. Find the way I first met him. He came into my office on, uh, I think, uh, yes, it was Wednesday morning. Came bursting in here, he did, with the dummy on his arm. First I thought he was joking. Then I realized he was deadly serious. <laughs> This man here, I refuse to share a dressing with him any longer. I insist that you arrange. We have two dressing rooms. Who? Who are you talking about? What man? This man here on my arm. He's no good. Can't even walk for himself. I've got to carry him everywhere. This is the one I can't stand any more. The nonsense. Now, what are you talking about? Here, you don't mean that dummy, do you? Of course I mean the dummy. That's what he is. A dummy. Gino here, my partner in the act. I can't stand it any longer. The arguments. Every night he comes into the dressing room, he fights with me. He argues with me. I want a separate dressing room. I refuse to dress in the same room as these little peep squeaks. Now listen, listen, now listen, Bertini. <laughs> Look, you expect me to believe... Now listen, that's just a dummy. He can't argue with you. He can't speak unless you speak for him. I think perhaps you're um, hitting the bottle a bit too hard, eh? Isn't that it? Oh, I've got, I've got, no, I've got no complaints. I mean, far from it. Your act's certainly bringing him in, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's just a dummy. He's made of wood and papier-mâché. Now, look, uh, Bertini, you just take things easy, eh? So, you think I'm drunk? You think I'm mad? I tell you, this swine here, this dummy, you say, he makes my life a misery. Are you going to give me the other dressing room? Oh, of course you can have another dressing room. You can have ten if you want. Sir. Thank you, thank you. Now then, you know good Gino. Are you satisfied? So you won't answer. You also want the manager to think that I'm too much with the drink. You little troublemaker. One day, one day, I will kill you. I tell you that for sure. Dummy, you're no dummy. One day, I kill you. Well, I ask you, have you ever heard anything like that? You see, well, as you no doubt know, but just in case you don't, a ventriloquist has his dummy, usually with a carved wooden face and hinged jaw. The ventriloquist himself operates this jaw and the turning of the dummy's head and so on by controls in the back of the dummy. And as for the voice, well, it's the ventriloquist himself, of course. He pitches his own voice a little higher. He speaks without moving his mouth or throat and he throws his voice. He projects it so that it sounds as if it's coming from somewhere else and not from him. But it's him all the time. And that's what made me think that Bettini was hitting the bottle too hard. I mean, when it comes to imagining things like that, well, I ask you. Anyway, I, uh, I gave him another dressing room for the doll, and the next day he was very much happier. Or he seemed to be much happier. Ah, good morning, senior manager, Benvenuta. How are you this morning? Me? Oh, I'm fine, Bertini. And you? Well, you look a lot happier today. And me? But of course I'm happy. Now at least I can get away from that doll. <laughs> ah, you think I'm mad, eh? But I tell you, I'm not mad. Maybe one day I will be with that doll. He drive me crazy. Yeah? Well... But now everything fine. Now, I put him in the dressing room and he stays there till the show. That's fine. <laughs> now I'm happy. But his happiness didn't last for long. That night after the show, I went backstage to see if everything was all right. And I heard voices coming from Bertini's dressing room. Not the one where he kept his dummy, the second one I'd given him, but his own dressing room. Yes. Voices. Loud and angry voices. At first I thought he was fighting with one of the stagehands. Then I realized he was talking to himself. Pretending to talk with a dummy, Gino. You understand? 
but really talking to himself. So I stood outside the open dressing room door and I listened. Well, I've never heard anything like that in ooh, the whole of my life. Who asked you to come in here, hey? Who asked you? If you don't like me in here, why don't you throw me out, eh? Don't, don't provoke me, you little monster. I will do that one of these days. <laughs> Talk is cheap. You stick me in another dressing room and you leave me there all day, all night. You take me back in this dressing room with you. Otherwise, the show does not go on next time. You understand? Oh, shut up, you twisted little monster. You make me sick. You think you can blackmail me like that? I'm not frightened of you. You hear that? I'm not frightened of you. <laughs> you better take care, my friend Bertini. If anyone were to pass in here this conversation, they would think you were crazy. <laughs> That's enough, Romeo. I'm telling you for the last time, Gino. If you don't shut up, I... I... I kill you. Up till then, I've been sort of humoring Bertini. That night, I watched the act. Well, there was no doubt about it. He was very good. More than that, he was great. Then halfway through the act, I got a surprise. A girl walks on. Yeah, that's right. A girl. Well, I knew nothing about that girl, and of course, as theatre manager, I was supposed to. But she comes trotting on, and she starts in taking part in the act. Well, she was nothing to look at, this girl, I can tell you. But then I saw just how brilliant Bertini was. He starts making the dummy Gino flirt with a girl, you know, winking, peering at her over Bettina's shoulder, the whole works. And the while Bettina's pretending to get more and more mad, or at least I thought he was pretending, anyway, that night, the act went bigger than ever. And after the show, I sent for Bettini to come and see me in my office. So he comes along with a dummy on his arm, and I could see at a glance that something was very wrong. You want to see me? Yes, yes. Sit down, Bertini. Thank you. Now then, uh, I caught your act tonight. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> you saw the girl, I suppose. Yes, that's right. I saw the girl. Now, listen, I'm not complaining. Well, uh, I am. I beg your pardon? Me, I'm a complaining. If that girl goes on tomorrow night, then I don't. Now, <laughs> wait a minute, You Bertini. think that I would change the act without telling you about it? You mean... You mean you didn't know? But how on earth... He, this little evil one, Gino, he did it. Gino? Now, hang on. Go on. Second. Go on, no, tell no, him. No. Tell him, you little follower of the black one. Tell him. Oh, I see. You see how clever this one is, uh, Mr. Manager. When you are here, he refused to talk. He wants you to think I'm mad. Because that is what he's trying to do. He's trying to drive me out of my mind. But, well, I will tell you. I will tell you what happened. This hunchbacked, watery legged swine, he came to my dressing room last night. Now, look, now wait a minute. Now, how can he come to your dressing room? He can't walk. He comes to my dressing room. To my dressing room. He walks inside. It's not the first time he's done such a thing. Then he tells me that tonight, in the show tonight, this woman must appear. I refuse. I tell him it's impossible. Never. I work only with a doll. No assistants and no women. And she goes on, Betty. She goes on. Otherwise, I don't. What you mean you don't? What you talk? Of course you go on. That at least I can make sure of. I carry you on myself. So I know that you will go on. Yes. You carry me. But you wouldn't like it if I walked off, would you? Walked off in front of all these people. You wouldn't like that. And I will do it. 
And this Maria comes on stage in the act tonight. You were bluffing. You wouldn't dare. Yes, I would. I would do it. I would get off your knee and walk on these horrible little legs made of old clothes stuffed with newspaper. I would walk off. So you see, Betty, my friend, you'd better do as I say. Now, uh, now, wait a minute. Now, hang on, Bertie. Are you trying to tell me that doll, that dummy, could have walked off the stage? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. You think I'm going crazy, but I tell you, it happened before. It happened in Milano before. He threatened to walk off. As he did. That's why I never work in Italy any more these days. Now, look here, Bertie. Look, you're a nice guy, and I hate to see you getting into this state. Now, what you're saying is quite impossible, you know. You don't believe me. You say I'm lying. No, 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 not at all. I believe that you think you're telling the truth. But I mean, what you've been saying is quite impossible. I mean, look at that, Dobby. Look at it. I mean, it isn't alive. It can't talk to you unless you do the talking, and it can't walk. What you say is impossible. Of course. That is what I should have known you would say. You think I work too hard and maybe drink too hard. And I imagine things. This is all your fault, you twist it for man. Why you no speak to the manager? Why you not tell him I speak the truth, eh? Drop dead, you stupid man. <laughs> in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Very nice, is it? I mean, would you stand for a dummy speaking to you like that? No wonder poor old Bertie thinks he's losing his marbles. Perhaps he's right. After all, we know that it's impossible for a ventriloquist dummy to speak on its own, don't we? <laughs> Well, I want to tell you that for a moment that when that dummy spoke, I thought that in some horrible, incredible way Bertie was telling the truth because I swear that although by this time Bertie was on his feet, the dummy was still sprawled in the chair where Bertini had put him. They were a couple of yards apart. Bertie never touched it, that I'm sure of. But when the dummy spoke, I swear by everything that's holy, that I saw the dummy's jaw move. Bertie picked up the dummy and he stormed out of the office. But not before I noticed that there were tears in his eyes. Yes, tears. And not the Latin tears of rage that one might have expected. He was crying. The silent sort of lost tears of complete hopelessness. Oh, I felt bad, I can tell you. I didn't know what to think. It was impossible that somehow Gino, the dummy, could have a mind of its own. It was, it was impossible that the dummy could walk and talk. It was impossible. But it seemed to be true. So the next night I watched the act again. And again, the girl was in it. And again, it went like a bomb. I went round backstage after the show and I knocked on Bertie's dressing room. I knocked. And Gino answered. Wow! <laughs> Come in. Ah, come in, Mr. 
manage you. Now, listen, Bertie. Yeah. What's this? Who goes on? Close the door. Bertie won't be long. Yeah, where... Where's Bertie? <laughs> You, Mr. Manager, I won't be long. I'm washing my hands. Wait a moment, please. Yes, there is uh, something I can do for you, maybe. Uh, but, Tilly, you were in there? Oh, oh, I see. I thought I was going round the bend. He spoke to you. Gino spoke to you, eh? Now, perhaps you'll believe me. <laughs> believe you? Now, oh, look, Bertie, look, don't try and get me believing the impossible. Any good ventriloquist like yourself could throw his voice from the washroom to in the here. Look, look, that doesn't mean a thing. But, but don't you see? What? Uh, he's so cunning, this one. You'll see what he does. <laughs> talks to you when he knows that you would think it is me doing the talking. You, you little... I will kill you. Get out! Now wait a second, I hate you again, you monster! Doc, will you stop that? You're making me think I'm going mad! It was brilliant ventriloquist work, I mean... He was hitting the dummy and making the cry of pain himself, of course. But it made me feel sick somehow. It, at least, that's what I thought was happening at the time. But today, I don't know anymore. The show that night was the last one that Bettini ever did. And it was nothing short of brilliant. I watched from the wings, and once or twice I could have sworn that Bertie and Gino spoke at the same time. Impossible, of course. But once or twice... Anyway, they had a real set to on the stage over this girl. Oh, it brought the house down. Once again, after the show, I went round to his dressing room. This time, the door was open. And before I went inside, I stood for a while listening. In a way, I wish I hadn't. But I stood there and listened. You heard what I said. I quit. I'm a finish to the act. I'm through. That's all right with me. Monster, go. See if you can get somebody else to put up with your nonsense like I do. You don't think I'll have any difficulty getting another job, do you? It's you that's going to have trouble. The Trilquists are still a penny. But where are you going to find another dummy like me? A dummy that does all the work for you. You going to be sorry, Percy. I can't go on like this. You're driving me mad. That's what you're doing. You're driving me mad. Why can't you be like the other dolls? Why can't you? I can't help the way I am. None of us can help that. Anyway, enough is enough. There's only one boss in here. That boss is me. <laughs> I don't care, Gino. I'm warning you, I don't care. I haven't made enough money. I'll retire. And what will you do with me? You. I'll lock you up inside your suitcase. I'll leave you in the cloakroom at the station. That's what I'll do. You, you wouldn't dare. Oh, yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> You're frightened now, aren't you? That's good. For too many years, I've been the one who has been frightened. Now it's your turn. <laughs> yes. You are frightened. So, you would stop me in this suitcase and put me in the station. Well, listen to me, Bertie. That wouldn't do you any good, you see. Do not I take that even in five years' time. Someone would open that gate and I would still be 
there. You can't starve me to death or suffocate me, you know. Even after ten years, I would still be there. And once they opened that case again, I would find you. I would find you. You couldn't. You would have done me at all. Yes. That's what we want people to think, isn't it? But you are a doll. I made you myself. I carved your face and I stuffed your legs and arms with newspaper. I know it's impossible. What you are saying is impossible. <laughs> you are a doll. A dummy. I'm not a frightened of a dummy. <laughs> then if you're not frightened, why are you shouting like that? I refuse to talk with you any longer. Shut up. The matter is a clause. I've made up my mind. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. Shut up! I'd, I'd heard enough. I wanted to walk away and leave him to it. Something prompted me to push the door open and walk in. The dummy was propped in a chair in front of the dressing room mirror. And by some chance, the way he'd been put there, it looked as if he was leaning on his elbows. Bertini was striding up and down the room like a man possessed. I couldn't know what I was going to say to him. I suppose in the back of my mind somewhere was the thought that I'd better start to calm him down. I stood just inside the doorway, my glance going from Bertini to the dummy. Bertini never noticed me. But to this day, I swear that that dummy looked me straight in the eye through that dressing room mirror and laughed. That's right. Go on. Laugh. Make the most of your laugh. Because, my friend, I tell you, this is the last time you laugh. <laughs> I made you myself. I know what you are. You are a nothing. So just right. That's what you are. I made you myself. And because I made you, I've got the right to, to finish you. I'm going to finish you. You hear me? I'm going to finish you. <laughs> He took three strides and knocked the dummy sprawling from the chair. I watched, horror-stricken, as Bertie lifted his leg and with the heel of his right boot pounded again and again into that dummy's wooden face. You don't believe me, monster. You didn't believe me. No, maybe you believe me when it's too late. I kill you. I kill you. I kill you. Bertini has made you. Bertini gave you life. And Bertini takes it away. Oh, come on, Bertie. Now, come on, old man. Look, you... I think you've done the right thing. It was only a dummy. Look, come along with me. Come on. You need a rest. He's still there. Yes, he's still in the sanatorium. I went to see him about five years back, but never again. I shall remember that to my dying day. I went inside that little private room, and he was propped up in bed. He lay there quite motionless, his eyes staring fixedly at the ceiling, and when I spoke to him, it took a second for him to answer. And then... Only his bottom jaw moved, as he said. It was good of you to come and see me, senior manager. But don't worry about me. I'm fine. doesn't know if he's Arthur or Martha. And we have a problem, too. We're not quite sure who this dummy is that we have 
here behind the creaking door. <laughs> in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door? Of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... Creaking door. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host like Retro Radio, Old Time Radio in the Dark, Micro Terrors, Scary Stories for Kids, The Church of the Undead, and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Haunted Empire State Building Bathroom was written by Aaron Taylor from the book Unfinished Business – Tales of Haunted Restrooms and Bathrooms, which you can find on Amazon, Kindle, and Audiobook. I've placed a link to it in the show notes. A Big Muddy Monster was written by Bridge Vaughn for the Patriot Press and from the New York Times archives. An Accidental Mass Murder at Oregon State Hospital was written by Cappy Lynn for the Statesman Journal and Macabre Mary at Puzzlebox Horror. Radiant Boy was written by Lux Ferry for Occult World. Grace Stevens and the Tragedy of the USS Eastland was written by Kathy Cressall for Haunted Rockford. The Burger Chef and Brown's Chicken Murders was written by Alexi Kakis and Andres Cipriano for Uncovered.com and Eric DeGreshi for Patch.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Leviticus 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And a final thought, it's a good thing to have all the props pulled out from under us occasionally. It gives us some sense of what is rock under our feet and what is sand. Madeline LaAngle. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Dark.